All right, here we go. All right, we'll give it a second to catch up out here and make sure it's actually working. All right. So chances are people are seeing us right now, but they, but I don't see us yet. That's how this crazy world works. <laughs> there it is. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview with the artist. And as I as I get my painting light out of the way, uh, very excited today. I am joined by Anthony Rodriguez of Pirate Monkey Painting. Hello, sir. Hi. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. Uh, like we were talking about earlier, I've been excited about this since we talked about it at Gen Con. So yeah, man, you were you were one of the judges there this year. You are a commission artist. You've painted for competition. You have won tons of awards, painted some amazing pieces, one of which is up on the screen right now. We're going to look at a lot yeah. more of your art later. Uh, you are somebody who I've just, I've loved the what you've been doing with your art for, for many, many years. And I'm just, I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Uh, really, really humbled by the kind words. I really mean that too. It's, it's, um, I'm still a relatively like new artist. And so receiving like compliments and accolades is something that I'm still learning to, <laughs> to you know, receive the, the right way. But, and you know, I, I, I'd love to say the same thing about yourself. I really only got introduced to your work this year. Um, like I've seen you running around places, sure. you know, at cons and, you know, I knew that you're everybody that I've talked to has said that you're incredibly, you know, nice, kind guy, excellent, excellent teacher. Um, and yeah, it's just, it, we were, you know, the, this, even though it's a small world, sometimes paths just don't cross. To right. Us sometimes, so, no, I get it. Like, I mean, you know, we, we are, our mutual, mutual friend, Anthony Wang. Like I didn't really get to sit down and talk to him until like this year, like basically early this year. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. anyway, let's talk about, let's talk about, uh, a lot of different things today. We're going to be going through your journey. I'm really yeah. excited, uh, because, you have done uh, just what I love about the pieces you sent me is it's this wonderful mix of stuff. And if all of you visit uh, Pirate Monkey Painting, which all the again, links to all of Anthony's uh, uh, socials and to his site, to his Patreon, all of that is down in the description. I would highly encourage you to go check those out. But what you're going to see is just an immense amount of variance in your work. What I love is, you know, we've got stuff like right now I have a more historical piece up that maybe people would think of as a more, maybe a more classical bust, right? But then yeah. when you look at the stuff that you've done, you've got things that are very exploratory and impressionistic. You've got high fantasy pieces. You've got like, you know, traditional games workshop stuff. It's all over the map. And I love it. You just, you seem to have such a wide variance of interest. Like if it's, in this yeah. hobby you have and want to paint it. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you know, a large part of that comes from the fact that like when I was, you know, and we'll talk about this here in a second, when I was coming up through my journey, I kind of hit a stopping point and this was, I'm trying to think it was probably 2013, late 2013, early 2014, where I was just like, I don't have any more miniature painting tutorials that I feel like I'm learning from. And so I started looking at, illustrators and they were like look at the old masters and yep. then that's kind of what led to trying more exploratory stuff like like you were saying like impressionism you know painting it in pastel like van gogh um i've even done a study of a of a surrealist bust uh that was originally done by dali that i you know kind of did on my own on a bust myself so there's and it's just fun not not trying to push the boundaries but just like what you said exploring and having fun right so right well, that's a good place to start. Let's start with your journey in miniature painting. I think that's that's usually where we begin on the show. We begin at the beginning. So, how did you get into miniature painting? Like, what was the what was the impetus there? So, uh, it's it's kind of like a two part story. Okay. Um, the first part kind of takes place when I was you know 12, 13 years old, and then I picked it back up later on in life when I was when I was young and when I was a kid. Uh, my mom was sick and we were out in Pennsylvania. Uh, my family traveled around quite a bit when I was young and we were at a mall kind of like, it was like, uh, I want to say like a few days after Thanksgiving or something. Okay. Sure. And there was a games workshop store. My brother saw, you know, the, I think it was for the battle from a crag, you know, sure. starter box. And he was like, that looks cool. I don't know what it is, but I want it. Um, and he ended up being really good at the game. I ended up really enjoying painting and all the stories <laughs> and all the lore and everything. Sure. Um, 
And so I really got into that. Um, really got into that when I was, you know, that age, entered into Young Bloods at uh, Chicago, I think it was Chicago 2006 okay. um, Games Day. Yep. And I got like best runner up in Young Bloods. Nice. Uh, and then, you know, girls started to look more pretty and, you know, <laughs> I got more involved with school and choir and all that. And, um, you know, just didn't really have the, the time or the, you know, the money at that age to really invest sure, into it. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I got out of it and then I'm trying to think, I, I'm pretty sure it was 2013, like late 2013, actually around this time, um, my then girlfriend, uh, that her and her family played D and D. Okay. And she was like, Hey, you know, we need some minis painted for this campaign that we're playing can you help out with that a little bit? And, um, you know, she was, you know, cause I had talked to her about having done it when I was a kid. Right. And so I was like, yeah, of course. Like, you know, I, why not give it a try? You know, I, I really wasn't doing much. Um, I was in the Marine reserve, the Marine Corps reserve at the time and kind of going to school and working part time. So I had, I had a fair amount of free time to kind of play around with. And so I did that, loved it, bought back into it. Um, tried to get into uh, war machine hordes, wasn't good at it at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, from there, I, it wasn't, it didn't take too long for me to get into like a master class. Um, and so I went and I took my first master class and, you know, kind of saw a, not a different side of it, but just that like, oh, hey, there's people that take this very seriously. Right. And, but then on the other side, like, hey, there's people that make a living doing this too. That's really cool. Um, kind of proceeded to get into things like painting Buddha, um, just watching, you know, miniature painting tutorials on YouTube, most of 2014. Uh, I went to my first uh, Adepticon crystal brush and, you know, got to meet a lot of the, a lot of the, the painting people, you know, right. from Europe that came over. Yep. Um, I'm not a person either that really fanboys. And so, and uh, I've lived in other countries. And so, that cultural divide wasn't as significant for me. Gotcha. And so it was very easy for me just to just have a conversation with somebody like Ben Kometz, um, or even Kirill Kanaev, or, you know, just, I mean, just a lot of the people from Europe that were coming over. And that was kind of the other dip into it where I was like, Oh, Hey, these, these guys are just like normal people. Like I can just hang out and have conversations with them sometimes. And, you know, like they're incredible. And of course. of course that was inspiring too, but, um, there was kind of like a shift that happened and I was like, okay, I'm really going to get into this. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure kind of at that time too, my relationship was degrading a little bit. And so I was just trying to find something to fill the time. Sure. Um, and yeah, so later that year I went out and I had a masterclass with, um, Alfonso Banshee. Yep. Um, and that was Incredible. I had already kind of dipped my toe. Eye opening, um, I suppose, to a degree, it was, right? Yeah. It, it was relatively eye opening. The the first day was like a refresher course for me. Sure. And a, a part of the reason why I say that is um a, probably a month or two after Adepticon, I was running out of resources from the miniature painting world. And um th thankfully the <laughs> the Google algorithm was like, hey, check out this this guy his name is noah bradley he's a illustrator who does work for uh wizards of the coast magic gathering yeah sure um all that good stuff and he, that was really my first introduction to um master studies and some more of the more not fine art like maybe illustrators and fine art kind of theories of how to learn and so probably a month or so maybe a month or two before I went out to Colorado for that, you know, workshop with Banshee, I really dipped really heavily into color theory, compositional theory, uh, just a lot of these nice. more. Yeah. And so the second day though, was really where I was starting to feel pushed. And Alfonso was great too, because I'd showed him a lot of the work that I had been doing before the masterclass. And he was like, if you keep doing this, and you use what we talked about in this class, like you're going to do very well because you know, I don't know how much you know about 
Alfonso, but he he does a lot of illustration and drawing and painting outside of the miniature side of things for yeah, himself. I'm, I'm very jealous of his his illustration ability to yeah, be completely he's, frank. He's great. It's terrible too because he thinks he's terrible. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just like, no, listen, man, like you're good at this. <laughs> He compares himself to like masters though, like master master, like, sure. you know, people who've been professionally just doing illustration for like 20 years. And so it's not, it's not, it's not a fair comparison, but there's always uh, a bigger fish. Yes, there's always a bigger fish. Exactly. Um, and if there's not a bigger fish and there's somebody that does something completely different than you and they're incredible at it and you know, you're, you wish you could do that. Right. 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 Um, so yeah. So um, after that, it was pretty much just, uh, you know, the the relationship with that girlfriend ended and I found myself with more free time than I knew what to do with. Sure. Right. Um, and so, you know, it, it was kind of a slow dipping into, um, but I started to escalate the amount of time that I was spending studying and painting um, probably from like, you know, uh, it, before that happened, I was maybe painting one hour, maybe two hours a day if it was a good day. And then it started transitioning into four hours a day, you know, and then it started to shift into like, you know, three or four hours of miniature painting and an hour or two of study. Um, and then it got to the point where it was like, I would wake up in the morning. It was two hours of, you know, drawing and master studies. I would work my 10 hour shift. I would come home. And it was another two to four hours right. of master studies and miniature painting. Um, and so I was really pushing myself. I was really grinding out a lot of hours. In the days that I had off, I was probably painting anywhere between six to, I would say, you know, six to eight hours. Sometimes I would do more. Right. Right. Um, so almost to the point that it wasn't healthy. But, um, and I have no problems admitting that but just because I, I didn't have anything else to do. I wasn't in a great place psychologically. And I knew that if I didn't um, occupy my time, then I would slip into something else that wasn't as right. favorable. Right. Right. Um, and I was, you know, it was great too because I had time to exercise and, you know, hike and go to movies. And I had a lot of, you know, money that I just, I wasn't spending a ton of money because I wasn't like, you know. Oh, if you don't leave your house. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who's like, yeah, it's Friday. I'm going to go out clubbing, you know, sure. or go to the bar. That's just not my, not my style. Um, and so, yeah, uh, then later that year, um, my, my brother and sister-in-law were in town for the holidays. And I was like, Hey, I've been thinking about this. I think I might want to go to Europe and kind of just travel and explore and just kind of learn, um, and just get out, kind of start, start fresh. Right. Um, you know, when you've been in a relationship that long and it just capsizes and you kind of need a f little bit of a fresh start sometimes. I think that's one of the best things that a person can do. And I've always wanted to go to Europe. Right. And, sure. um, is there like great idea? Go for it. Um, and so, yeah, I pretty much just spent the next, um, four ish months, three and a half, four ish months. And I had already been saving, but, um, I just, was pushing even harder to save. Um, and so, yeah, went to Adepticon that year and, um, when was it mid or early April? I think okay. I hopped on a plane with a one-way ticket to Dublin and then to England. And that's where I, 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 you know, found myself in Europe for like six months i think almost it's so Maybe. crazy yeah I, lo I love like i i had known you had done this but i never knew the details and so i'm so yeah. fascinated by this so you're over there for yeah like almost six months you're what like biking around just hanging out with artists learning from them? Yeah. is that the idea yeah pretty much like i i literally used a full tourist visa to england and a full tourist visa in the the european visa area called the Schengen zone. Um, and so, uh, and yeah, and before I had gone over, you know, of course I had gone back into, like I was telling you exercising and, um, I had kind of fallen on the idea of something called bike touring, okay. um, which is essentially you just have a bike, you put bags on your bike and you bike your bike all over the country. Right. And 
so that was, uh, you know, that was like one of the goals of the trip and something that I did quite a lot of when I was there. So, um, so got over to England, uh, flew from, you know, Chicago, Toronto, Toronto to Dublin. And I found out that there is like a $300 price difference. If instead of flying to London Heathrow or one of the other London airports, if I flew to Dublin, I could get a ticket for about $650. Okay. And then from Dublin to London, it was like $40. $40. Nice. And so I, yeah. And instead of 1200, right, 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 right. right. So I probably saved like four or $500 on travel expenses. And that was enough for me to say, I'm not going to spend the money here on a bike and take it there. I'm just going to buy a bike there. Um, and that's what I did. Um, after a few weeks of, uh, I had a friend, um, Jack Crow. I don't know if you remember him or if you are are aware of him. Uh, he was one of the painting Buddha guys. Oh, okay, um, gotcha. That I had gotten to know fairly well. Uh, really, really lovely guy. He, you know, I, I he's kind of been out of the community for a while now, but I hope he's doing well. Um, but yeah, so he he let me stay with him um, for a couple months. It was wow. almost, it was like two two and a half months, but you know he was. Uh, I, I don't want to say in a bad spot, but he was just kind of almost in a similar spot that I was where he was just kind of in a reorienting kind of headspace. Yep. And it was really great because the creative energy that we both kind of gave to each other was fantastic. You know, we would usually spend most of the day in the studio painting and working and there wasn't really any pressure to like work right? Um, or pressure to produce it was more of a you know sometimes we just sit for hours and talk you know art theory or philosophy or about books or movies and that kind of stuff and kind of ideas and how to pull those into you know uh, a more visually creative medium um, and then also lots of like we would go and hike around the countryside and you know he he lived kind of way outside of London and absolutely beautiful countryside um, and yeah that was that was quite a few, that was a couple months. Um, and then one day, you know, we were walking around in the countryside and I hurt my ankle pretty badly. Um, I actually, I kind of like rolled it both ways. Oh, I, and I know it sounds crazy, but I guess it's a thing and I did it. Um, and so I was pretty much on, not bed rest, but I was, I was pretty much on a couch or in a chair for um, about a week and a half ish. And it still wasn't great. It was still kind of weak, right. but like I had ordered my bike to a, a place in London. And um, so I was like, all right, time to go get the bike downtown London. Like it was my first time to taking the London underground system on my own. Cause you know, Jack had a, a, a previous engagement so he couldn't come with me. And, um, and so, yeah, it uh, went downtown, got my bike, you know, figured out all the hours that I could take my bike on the underground and which rails I could take my bike on the underground. Right. And, um, had my first little adventure of like cycling in downtown London, which was a blast. I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, you must like, be, if that was an enjoyable experience. Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, Oh, this is the best. <laughs> um, it was a little bit crazy, you know, I'd kind of get in traffic and I kind of knew, you know, I'd have the Google maps in my ear kind of saying like, you know, turn left here. And I would kind of, uh, I was able to navigate fairly well and, and get to the underground thing. And then that did most of the legwork until I got back to that area. And um, yeah, after that, it was really just kind of resting. And I think I had about a week and a half, maybe two weeks before I was leaving for France. And so I kind of did a, a small buildup um, of like, all right, today I'm going to do you know, 10 or 15 pounds in my bags. Right. And I'm going to cycle 10 miles or something. And then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do like 20 pounds and I'm going to cycle, you know, 15 or 20 miles or something. And so I was able to do it and kind of get used to the different balance of the bike. And, um, I don't know how much my bags weighed when I actually left, but they weren't light. I know that much. Um, and yeah, then I went to, to France, um, over to Paris. I went over to Paris and, I was on my own. I was really on my own um, from then until I got to Spain. And so Paris was incredible. Um, uh, kind of going back to, to London, Jack took me to a lot of the 
art museums and art galleries. Right. Met a lot of the the miniature painters from that area, um, and we actually went to the Games Day there in um, oh where is it? It's up kind in, of like up in Coventry. Oh, yeah, Coventry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. And um, it was really cool because it was like um, it was 2016, and the last games they had been to was 2006, and so oh, it was nice. kind of like a ten year full circle of like, hey, like it's been ten years and I'm back doing this in the place that like when I was a kid I wish that I had I could have gone to right, right. right. And so um, that was great. Um, entered a entered a piece, but nobody had thought to tell me that like games workshop had become very strict about like the color of the skin for the orcs. And so I painted the orc skin like red. Oh yeah, sure. They're like, Oh no, like you may as well just not have entered because they're, they literally renamed them green skins. Like if it's not green, it's, you know, it doesn't count pretty much. <laughs> and so I was like, whatever. Um, but anyway, that was a great conduit. Cause I got to meet a lot of other people. Yeah, sure. Uh, from the, the European community. I got to meet Volomir, um, there's a guy Percival, um, out of the Czech Republic, um, you know, some more of the Spanish guys, the Polish guys. Well, that's just uh, it. A lot of those, like a lot of the, the mainland European guys will come up for that, yeah. you know, for that fest, for that games day, because again, yeah. just like you saw with the cheap flight from Dublin, they can basically hop a cheap same day flight that morning for, for not many euros at all, go up yeah. there, compete go home that evening right it's a one-day trip like it's so cost effective for them it's the kind of experience we just don't have here in america no and i mean it it would be it would be equivalent from flying from like maybe chicago to um maybe like dallas like it's not very far sure like even from poland like from poland to england like it's not a long flight and their their airfare is very affordable their travel is very affordable so so somebody in the chat was saying it sounds like the rocky movie for painting yes it, it makes me think of pokemon too uh, <laughs> and it was kind of funny because pokemon go came out when i was in europe and i was like oh yeah i can travel around and actually become the pokemon master absolutely absolutely <laughs> um but yeah so had that experience went to paris um I had one of my rules when I was traveling solo was like, I don't want to, I, you know, I couldn't afford it either. I literally shoestring the whole, the whole trip for maybe six or seven grand. Um, gotcha. And so um, I stayed in a lot of Airbnbs, um, a couple hostels, and I actually camped a lot, um, which was really cool. So anyway, did Paris, um, all the museums there, the, Paris experience kind of thing. Of uh, it was raining the whole time. There were actually like record floods that year. Oh wow! Um, well, that had to be year. fun for the bike then. It, yeah, it was. It was. It was really cool. Um, it just it was interesting seeing all the locals taking pictures of the river because you know, like, oh, this is legit. Like, if the locals are doing it and not the tourists, like, um, so yeah. And then I cycled from Paris all the way to um, kind of the one of the border areas of Spain, uh, okay. which is San Sebastian, Spain. Um, and that, that trip took me, I want to say about 10 or 11 days. Um, and it was about, it was almost 700 miles. Um, and so it, it wasn't, it, it sounds like a lot, but like I was only doing it in like 40 to, I, I think my average miles per day was like 55. Which is still um, pretty good. Yeah, it's still pretty good. You know, it, it's not like I'm like going though, yeah, you know, sure. it's kind of like, oh, I'm just going to go. I maybe was going like, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 miles an hour right. average. And, you know, if you just kind of take it easy and go, you can cover a lot of miles. Fast. It's, it, it's interesting because it's about the equivalent, um, the equivalent speed as it would be if you were riding horseback, which is really the way that Europe is meant to be traveled, right? Because that's how the society was structured for so long. Um, and so, yeah, got to Spain, um, a little bit earlier on the bike thing. I had aggravated the ankle again. And so I took it easy in San Sebastian, which is absolutely incredible place. It's like the kind of place, like if I could retire anywhere, right. that's where, right. It, it's one of those like kind of secret places, um, out of the 10. All right. Nobody, people at home, shh, shh, yeah, don't, shh. don't share. Yeah. Keep it on the down low. Um, so out of the 10 best restaurants in the world, three of them are in San Sebastian. <laughs> My yeah. God. Yeah. So just the, the, the street food was like 
incredible. Right. Um, so yeah, and then from there I went to Madrid, and that's really where like the next kind of big, like exciting kind of stuff happened. Um, I stayed in Madrid for about two and a half ish weeks. Um, I found an Airbnb. It was literally downtown Madrid, which was incredible. Um, of course, did the museums there. You know, uh, did the Prado, the Reina Sofia, which is like the modern art gallery and the historical art gallery, and then a couple of the smaller ones. Um, probably one of my favorites though, was the, uh, Joaquin Sorolla. He's a structural impressionist. Okay. Uh, and those, those guys are the guys that really, you know, kind of get me going. I really love those guys. Um, uh, but then even more exciting than that, I got to spend a lot of time with, you know, people like Banshee, uh, Mark Mosklans, Volomir, um, you know, right. Uh, the whole crew over at big child creatives, which at the time was Sergio and, uh, Ruben Martinez and there's another guy. Um, and yeah, I mean, a good bit of it was hanging out with Alfonso and Volmir and just kind of like, not even like painting. It was more of just like the, you know, getting to know them and their, their friends and, you know, like Alfonso's wife and Volmir's now wife. And, um, you know, and we did, I did still go to their studio spaces, and we did still talk miniatures, but I was very upfront about the fact that like, Hey, I'm traveling. I'm here to get to know you. Um, and I, as much as I would love to pay for one-on-ones and tutoring, right. I can't. And so I, I just want to let you know that I'm here to build a friendship and not necessarily, n- not necessarily try to like steal information or, you know, anything, does that make sense? I'm it trying totally to totally does. Yeah. Because you, you, you don't want to put them over a barrel. What you weren't trying to do is say, Hey, look, I just biked all the way from Paris. How about we go paint a little, I know normally people would pay a large amount of money to sit down for several right. days of private instruction for you. But I was thinking maybe you could just do me a solid, right? And that isn't what you yeah, wanted exactly. to do. Yeah, yeah. You were like, actually just there to great. hang out, to be friends, to, to just, exactly. yeah. To take well, in this, and- the, the, the culture the art, everything. And just, build relationships yeah. and community well and and so much uh, so much to that i don't think a lot of people realize is that like if you can if you can get to the background of it, it's kind of like what we're doing that right now right like it's kind of like an informal interview to some extent we're like yep. we're both getting to know each other and that's really inspiring like learning somebody's story is incredibly inspiring and when you have that insight you kind of know why they create art. And if you can kind of learn, like learn how to teach yourself with doing studies, then, and you get to know the person, you can kind of learn from their style without having them looking over your shoulder. Right. Right. And beyond that, just like seeing their creative spaces and kind of like, they're excited about it too. They want to talk about it with a peer as well. Right. And so, um, you know, especially with those, like, you know, we like, it's one of those things like where we worked out together, we got dinner together. We like stayed in a park longer than we should have. And, you know, I got to hang out with all the families and everything. So there, there's those kind of experiences too, which are just priceless, right? Like you can't buy that. You can't, you can't buy that kind of experience or friendship. So that's the kind of stuff that I, I love. I love remembering. And, um, you know, on the, on the miniature side of things, I did get more formally invited by big child creatives to come out and be like, Hey, come check out what we're doing, you know, come and hang out and paint. Um, you know, we'll show you around. And so I got to see kind of how that business was set up, how it was run, how, what their, their pipeline of things kind of looked like. Um, I got to sit down and paint and I could go over and, you know, I had shaken hands and I already knew quite a few people. And so I could just go, Hey, look at this like what needs to be done. And I was at the level where they could just say, you need to do this, this, and this. And I could go away after just bugging them for like a minute and work. But the nice thing too, about that kind of space was that like, there weren't just miniature painters, right? There were illustrators, there were sculptors, there were, you know, people from a lot of different creative backgrounds that could go, you know, the shape is wrong. You need to do this with the color. Like, and they could just kind of push you in a way that a miniature artist might not have. 
Well, because um, everybody's then approaching it from a slightly different focus, right? It's the lens through right. which you see what you're looking at. There's also a lot of different artistic inspiration there because all of them are going to approach their craft slightly differently, think about things differently, attack <laughs> things differently. Like that's just such an amazing environment to be in because yeah. you're getting so many per- different perspectives. And, you know, they all might end up in somewhat different or in somewhat, somewhat of the same place. That is to say they all end up at some finished artistic project. Right. Right. But how they got there, how they thought about it, the inspiration they took and how they manifested that into reality, I think is going to be often very different. And that's cool. It's very different because it's constant collaboration. Um, And it's very different than like what I do here in my studio, which is me sitting in a room all the time working on my own. And I think that's a part of the reason why the U.S. sometimes has a hard time getting like and I think the U S is actually bridging the gap from where the Europeans are to where like our level is. Um, but they're just so much closer to each other that like, yeah. you know, you, you can just say, Hey, can I like, can I show you this in person and can we right. hang out and get a beer and, you know, just interact on that level instead of, you know, like, Hey, I'll see you at ReaperCon or I'll see you at Nova. Like yeah. then I get to show you this thing that I've been working on in my studio for three months intermittently, you know, by myself alone in a room. Yeah. You know, one of the things I've talked about many times is in talking to, and I mean, it's, it's a different, it's a different end product and purpose, but it's at the same time kind of similar. So that the way the heavy metal team works is Mm -hmm. basically like 10 of them are in a room together and every project they do gets passed around to every other artist in the studio to review and look at it when they plan out, a piece, they all talk together about what they want it to look like, right? It's that collaboration. And I think we often lack that a lot here, you know, because there's so many people that I'm friends with and I'll share work with, but it's, it's, I'm sitting here working most days and every couple weeks, maybe a month or something, I'll send them a picture and say, what do you think? Right? Right. Like, how's that going? And that's just a completely different experience than literally being able to lean over your shoulder and go, hey man, what are you doing there? How's that going? Or, you know, whatever. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even people that are somewhat geographically close to each other like there there's a, a few people in uh st louis for instance like cat martin chris sure right um i think there's I'm, I'm trying to remember there's somebody else in that area and they live they still live like one one and a half two hours away from each other and so it's still not like easy to get together right they, even they wait for the con that happens at in st louis to actually meet up and even then and they're not like meeting up like they're just there to show their work and teach and hang out. And so it's, it's very, um, it's a very different experience for sure. Um, but yeah, so anyway, got to do the whole big child creative thing for a couple days. Um, just incredible experience. Um, and then kind of, that was kind of closer to the end of my time. It was like the last week or so. Gotcha. Uh, and then I couldn't renew my Airbnb anymore. So I was like, okay, this is time. Like it's time to go. And I, you know, I, I didn't get the chance to hang out with Alfonso. So he was like, Hey, just crash at my place for a night. Um, come to the studio, hang out and paint and, you know, um, and so I got to go to Banshee studio, hang out, paint there. Um, you know, I, I didn't, he, he kind of worked and I just kind of painted and looked at his miniatures and, you know, kind of, kind of his books and, you know, all the, all the stuff and very, very inspiring and, um, yeah, then that night just kind of hung out and I, I actually helped him and his wife, you know, plan some of their honeymoon, which was really great. Um, <laughs> nice. Or his now wife, I should say. Sure. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, it was just a really great time. Then the next day he took me to the bus station with my bike and I hopped on a bus to Barcelona. Um, and yeah, Madrid was, Madrid was, Madrid was great too for me. Just because um, I have Latin heritage, um, of course, and it was it was very interesting for me because it was one of the first places that I actually was like, "Hey, I'm just one of the people here. I'm just normal here." Gotcha. Like there wasn't quite the like the look of like you know, yeah, what's the Hispanic guy doing? You know, <laughs> um, and and to the point where like I had tourists asking me in very poor Spanish, like, "Hey, how do we get here?" And then I'd break out in perfect English and they'd be like, Oh, you know? Um, but yeah, so, so Barcelona then, so then I went to Barcelona, uh, Barcelona was really great. Um, 
I think Barcelona would have been better if I hadn't done San Sebastian before. Gotcha. Sure. <laughs> so I was very spoiled by San Sebastian. Um, I still had a great time in Barcelona. I had made friends with a, a, a Scotsman uh, when I was in Madrid. And he was going to Barcelona a few days before I was. And so, hey, he was like, hey, man, we'll catch up. We'll hang out. I'll show you around. Um, so did Barcelona. Uh, got to got to meet up with a, a miniature painter there called uh, Jerome, uh, I think is his name. And he's a really lovely, really, really kind guy. He kind of showed me around some of the the non-touristy areas. Oh, um, that's, that's always awesome. Which is always great. You yeah. know, we got to have some some of the real, like, local food that wasn't, like, you know, really shit paella um, for the tourists. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, that was really cool. And then I um, originally what I was kind of looking at doing was actually going down into, uh, I think it's Morocco and then cycling kind of the Northern part of Africa, but Africa in the middle East in that region was kind of a bit more sketchy than I thought it was going to be uh, at the time. And so I just hopped on a, a ferry and it took me from Barcelona all the way over to um, Rome. Uh, there's a port that kind of, you know, that Rome uses. Uh, and so kind of got into that city, took a train down to Rome and I was in Rome for, Oh yeah. Like probably Ostia or something is where you went into, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah something like that. Um, it's been a while. And I, so I'm having a hard time. Remembering. No, you're okay. It was just a little city too. I right. mean, if you even want to call it a city, but so yeah, I was in Rome for four ish days. Rome is a madhouse. Rome is absolutely chaotic. Um, I love, I love Rome, but it's like, it's, I, I, I really need to go to New York to see how it compares, like which city gets the, the award. But it's it's almost like lawless to some extent because like nobody follows the nobody follows the the like the road signs. Nobody sure. you know, like you can get on a bus without a ticket and nobody gives a shit. Like it's very like you know it's very freewheeling to some extent. Gotcha. Like there's still rules, right? But like a lot of the like, I'm trying to think. Like, if you compare it to like Germany, for instance. Oh, okay. Yeah. The rules sure. are like the rules are there for a reason. You follow the rules; they aren't optional. Like in Rome, a lot of the rules were optional, and so it was a uh, it was really interesting. That was kind of the first time that I had really experienced culture shock, um, a little bit, and I very quickly got over it. It took like just a couple days, and I was like, okay, this is how it goes. This is how people do things. Okay, I'm good. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of did the big things, you know, went to went to some of the museums, went to the Vatican, um, you know, saw all of that, sure. saw all the art, the uh, St. Peter's and uh, what's the Michelangelo, the big, the Sistine Chapel, yep. all the, all the, you know, kind of touristy stuff and saw the Coliseum. Um, I didn't feel like spending like, it was like 50 or 60 euros to go into the Coliseum. I was like, I'm good. I'm nah, I looking. can see it from out here. I would do the exact same thing. I'd be like, nope, this is good. I got the idea. Yeah. I got to see the inside of it when I flew over it, when I was coming back for see, months. Of, you know? So it all, it all works out. So yeah, but I, I really got to explore the city. I, I'm, I love going kind of out of the beaten path. And again, I look very Latin. And so when I was in Rome, people just assumed that I like, I might not have dressed the same way as a lot of the Romans would have, but I looked tan enough and I, you know, I have the right facial structure where people are just like, wow, he's just, you know, walking. Um, and so I, I never got bothered. Um, gotcha. and so Rome was crazy. The guy that I, the guy that from the Airbnb that I stayed with too was like super nice. And it was just like the most Italian kind of thing where he was like, oh i'm so sorry i can't be there i want to you know i wish i could get to know you better and he was like but you know what i'm gonna call my cousin he owns the pizzeria around the corner like just tell him <laughs> i sent you and he's gonna take care of you and like it, i mean it, and it was a thing like i went over there and he was like you know what you're so-and-so's guest and friend and he's like you know just, we're just only gonna charge you like half you know or something and they like brought me a free you know a couple glasses of wine and i thought the tab was gonna be massive and they were like oh no, no you're you know it was, it was just one of those really you know interesting experiences where it was just like, you know, I, I just was you know, you just don't expect it sometimes, but it was great. So anyway, then I went to Florence. Uh, Florence yeah. was amazing. Florence is, if you want, if you need creative energy, like if you're ever just like, 
in a very low place and you're like, I need creative energy, just go to Florence and you'll be good for like a week. Um, uh, nothing too crazy happened besides visiting the museums, just kind of, you, if you just walk the city, like the streets in Rome or Florence, there's so much art. Um, and, uh, where'd I go from there? From there, I went to Venice. Um, but on the way to Venice, I found out that Venice is extremely expensive. Um, surprise, surprise. <laughs> right. Now, are you still biking at this point or were you taking like bus or what were you doing at this point? Um, yeah, it was a mix of, uh, when I got to Italy, Italy, I, I really didn't feel like cycling Italy too much because it's sketchy. They really don't have the infrastructure set up for it. Um, and so it was a lot of like, I would, I would use my bike to get around the city sometimes. Gotcha. Um, but I wasn't doing like distances. Um, and so, uh, until I got to Venice, when I got to Venice, I had to cycle to the campground that I was staying at. Um, so I got to Venice, I kind of was walking around the city with a bike and I did not know how small the streets were. Like the streets are tiny, right. like, um, some of them, some like the, the good size street, like my studio is maybe, uh, 10 feet, like right. wall to wall. The big streets are like this. The small streets are maybe like five feet. And so I was walking around Venice with my bike and so it was very, very cramped and it took a while. And so I was like, I got to get out of here because this just is not, this is not set up for me to do what I need to do. It's expensive. None of the museums here are too particularly interesting. I need a break. Like I need a vacation for my vacation. Yeah, sure. (laughs) And so what I ended up doing is I ended up kind of taking a ferry out to, there's kind of this bay that surrounds Venice kind of in the center. And I went to the kind of the Northern ish one. And I literally just camped there for like, week and a half just chilled and that was amazing like there was not a lot of cell phone signal or internet so i just i had a couple audiobooks so i listened to audiobooks i drew i swam in in the sea and just kind of recuperated essentially um and so yeah sorry i, I know i'm going through the whole kind of no, the whole it's thing. okay i mean it's like fascinating. a little bit longer yeah, yeah so. this is this is uh, like a this is a singularly amazing experience. So we're all gonna live vicariously through <laughs> you doing it. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, from from Venice, I finally because I finally I'm pretty Venice. sure if I told my wife I'm gonna go spend six months doing this, <laughs> I would be murdered. I wouldn't make it to the plane. Either that or she'd be like, No, that's fine, just don't ever come back. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's no way I could do it now either. I'm glad I did it when I did it. Right. I was single. I was young. I had, had the money. Like I didn't mind eating the same kind of cheap food day in and day out sometimes. And so, um, so yeah, um, let me see here. So yeah, I, uh, I went from, from Venice. I went up to Germany. Um, I had a friend from the U S She's a high school friend. Uh, she lives in Constance. Okay. And where the Council of Nicaea took place. Uh, yeah. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, at, at one period in history, there were actually three popes. And the Council of Nicaea is where they met to determine who was going to be like the pope. Um, and so that was really cool. For um, that part of our audience that isn't Catholic, this is good catch up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so. It, that was that was really the second time that I experienced a little bit of culture shock. And it, it was like we were talking about earlier because the German culture is so much, especially South Germany, like Bavaria is so much more like rules, like, right. you know, like even jaywalking. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, Which, I, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I remember I had a, uh, a professor in college was telling a story about the time he had spent in Germany. And he mentioned like how he had stepped off a road to jaywalk. And, and some, like an older <laughs> gentleman literally grabbed him by the shoulder and said to him in German, we do not do that. And then pointed <laughs> yeah. like down toward the crosswalk. Yeah. yeah. Like that is a different world of rule following. Yes. It is. Yeah. It's very, and uh, it was even more exaggerated because I was coming from Italy. Um, sure. And, you know, so I, and I've heard that same kind of story from quite a few people where the like you know they'll they'll literally be they'll 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 be confrontational about it but not like violent about it sure like but if you continue to do it then they will call the police like um and so it, it was it was less that for me and more of like a couple of people going like the kids 
like what are you doing you know right. <laughs> and um there was that and then of course my friend you know she had been living there with her boyfriend you know attending university for about a year and a half almost two years so she was very culturally fluent right and it was like just follow me if you're good like just don't do something like unless i do it kind of thing and so i think i was there for maybe four ish days and so i kind of got used to the rhythm of it pretty quickly um and you know it was just this really eh, just beautiful little town um yeah it, it was really nice i mean the alps are kind of right there to the south i forgot to say too that i i went through switzerland kind of going there and had a little yeah, sure little misadventure in Switzerland, but nothing really, you know, beyond just kind of walking around the river near Zurich and, you know, having yep. a really crazy Chinese, you know, Airbnb roommate for a night um, and meeting the, the, the Swiss version of the most interesting man in the world. So the, my, my host in Switzerland uh, was like, essentially he said like, one day I just decided I was going to quit my job. I'm going to fly to Argentina, buy a Land Rover, and I'm going to drive to Alaska. And that's what he did. Okay. <laughs> now that's a heck of a road trip. I'm impressed. Yeah. yeah. I've driven so to Alaska, he, but I started much more northly. So I guess so there you go. Yeah. Um, so he, you know, he kind of liked me because I was kind of doing this whole adventure kind of thing. And, um, but anyway, um, so yeah, I, Germany, and then I got in, it was like three or four days with my friend. And then, you know, I had kind of been messaging Roman Lapot and he was like, you need to come now if you're going to come because I have a, I have a one-on-one -on -one this weekend and I can't have you here when that's going on. Right. Kind of thing. And so I was like, all right, you know, I told my friend, Hey, I got to go. And she was like, okay, bye. You know, and I, I hadn't planned on being there for a super long time to begin with. Um, and so, yeah, took off to Augsburg. Um, and I, I think I spent, how long was it? It wasn't very long. I think it was like, two two days maybe three days with roman um i think it was two days and a night it wasn't long um but he it was literally like the only time that i could have got to spend time with him essentially right. and it's roman the pop right uh, sure he's, sure he's an amazing guy so um you know took off took off really early that day on bike um cycled maybe 20 miles to um, a train station that could get me to Munich that could then get me to Augsburg. Um, got there kind of like mid late morning, hung out, went to his studio, um, spent the afternoon evening in his studio. He took me to a little kind of local, you know, diner, uh, not diner. I shouldn't say diner, like restaurant. Um, yeah, sure. they had very traditional South German food. So that was really great. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was, it's Roman, like Romans, Romans, he's great because he's kind of like, a he's like a artist, but he's also a bit of a philosopher to some extent. Absolutely. Like he's very like spiritual and very like, um, I don't know. There's he, you know, I mean, you know, him. the guy's got yeah. an energy about him and absolutely being where he lives and kind of getting to know him at that level was very very interesting because he's he's a small town guy like he loves where he lives he doesn't want to go anywhere else like he you know it's and so it was very interesting because our our personalities in that way were very contrasted where i haven't really lived anywhere longer than three years in my entire life and so um yeah it was very interesting and it was incredible too because i got to stay at his his apartment yeah it like in his studio actually was where he had the like the pull out, you know, couch. Oh, wow. And so I literally got to sleep next to like a ton of his, you know, just right. incredible pieces, including, yeah. uh, what is it? The, the last light. Yeah. Last like, light. Literally, literally the last thing I saw before I fell asleep was the last light. That's so amazing. It was, <laughs> it was just one of those, like, you know, very surreal experiences. And so, yeah, then we, uh, kind of got up, you know, went around, got some breakfast, um, met up with uh, the guy who was going to be his student for the the one-on-one -on -one that weekend who actually ended up being um, Joshua Lai. Um, are you familiar with him? No. no. So Joshua Lai does these really incredible kind of like uh, micro um, display bases. He works a lot with like the acrylic resin. Okay. 
Um, and so that it, it was very interesting because it actually that was the introduction of those two guys who hadn't really met, and it was something that actually en- it ended up blossoming into a very good relationship. That he act- Joshua actually became a part of the massive voodoo team. Oh wow, that's so, so cool. Yeah, it was really it was really interesting. Uh, it was kind of cool to be there for like a little a little bit of uh, the miniature world history in Europe. So, um, I was gonna say so yeah. I went from um, I was like uh, you know I kind of was asking Roman like where should I go next and he was like you know Berlin Poland or the Czech Republic and he was like you need to go to you should go to one of those places and um, so I actually had actually made a friend from the Czech Republic like I was saying earlier in England and so I was like hey man can I come hang out for like a week um, and the Czech Republic is actually out of the Schengen area. So, or I, maybe it's in, I can't remember. Um, but anyway, went to the Czech Republic for a week, got there like late at night, um, probably later than was safe. Um, it, it, that was again, like talking about culture shock, that was really culture shock for me. Everything else was like kind of, you know, Western culture ish. Sure. Right. Sure. The Czech Republic is like, you know, of course, it was in the you, you know the Eastern Bloc, Soviet yeah. Union, yeah. yeah. And so it was very different seeing the architecture and the way that the city was laid out, and you know, all of those things for me was very foreign. I wasn't expecting it, and so cycled up to my you know to my friends. You know, he was kind of late from work, and so I was just like, just chilling, nice. <laughs> you know, outside this very very Soviet looking. Uh, looking apartment complex and it was just like, I hope I'm in the right spot, bro. (laughs) 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 Really don't feel, I really don't feel like, you know, popping a tent over here and, you know, pushing my luck. Um, (laughs) And uh, so he finally showed up and, you know, we got up and hung out and chatted and, you know, late into the night as thing, those things go. And um, the next day, I guess I had done something and I had aggravated my sciatic nerve. And so I was literally laid out for like, almost a week. Wow. Which was a, it was a bummer. Cause I really wanted to explore the city a little bit more. He was great though. Like I, I did my best to kind of like, um, like I cooked a lot for him for instance. And he, I, I love cooking. That's kind of like my hobby. Gotcha. Um, and so I did that kind of thing for him. Like I would buy like beers and just kind of fun stuff just to kind of try to thank him for, you know, taking for care of me. Basically a bit. Showing up and then not being able to leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, I still painted, but I literally like had to paint in like the prone position. Um, and we would just kind of hang out and watch Star Trek and, you know, paint. Nice. It was. And um, so, yeah, um, I finally like got better and was able to explore the city. And, you know, I really didn't go to any museums. But by that time, like I was starting to run a little bit thin on cash. Um, and yeah, so. So from there, from Prague, I went to Berlin. Berlin is amazing. That was I, I love that city. That city was really, really great. The um I don't I don't know. Like I what I try to explain to people is like it's like Chicago, but more chilled out. Like hmm. um and then of course, like I did a lot of cycling there too, because it, the infrastructure is so well set up for it. Um of course, I got to hang out with people. Um, got to spend a little bit of time with Matt Seshwicks. Um, oh, nice. Got to spend a couple days with um, Ben, which was really cool. I uh, actually got to go over to Ben's flat and see a studio and all that good stuff. And um, I actually met up with Michael from Painting Buddha. And okay. I like he actually let me crash at his place for a couple nights. So, and I, like the place where I slept was actually the painting booty Buddha studio. So it was where they filmed and recorded, like, and, you know, did a lot of the editing for all the painting Buddha stuff, which was awesome. Really. And the guy was like a miniature painting or a miniature collector, like literally had a room full of like Warhammer fantasy and, 40k stuff man who would have a room and, full and of rack. Warhammer fantasy and 40k stuff what a what a what, what a weirdo <laughs> he said looking around behind him no i get you absolutely. no no but not not like a like um like wall to like floor to ceiling yeah like 
the entire room packed. Yeah, live in like, the dream. My yeah, I'm, my I'm hopeful future state I'm aiming at. Yes, I gotcha. It was probably like a a, a 10 foot by like 20, 25 foot room just packed. Literally floor to ceiling almost. That's with, amazing. Yeah. And it, so it was the Warhammer, all the Warhammer stuff, and then also Rackham stuff. I mean, there was just yeah. like an incredible amount of like, you know, it's, it's like Candyland. It's like, you know, the, the Wonka Chocolate Factory where, you know, but the, the guy is just very, very in, like more ideas than a lot of people. But the problem for him was that he just had a hard time focusing on one idea. And that was a part of kind of why painting Buddha died is that it was hard to get him to focus. And he, he was the one who was investing the cash into things as well. So it was a whole dynamic and um, it was very interesting kind of talking to, I, I should really do some kind of like article, right? Cause I was like almost accidentally doing like journalism. Yeah. On it's, it. it's, it, it almost was, does investigative journalism here. Yeah. yeah. You were on the street getting the real story. Exactly. <clears throat> like, cause I, I was spending time with and talking with, you know, Michael, Matt and Ben. And so, and then also just kind of hearing, I heard a, another side of it because I was staying with Jack in England. And so like, uh, you know, I could probably do like a few thousand word article <laughs> this many years later, but anyway, so um, yeah, Germany was great. Uh, Berlin was amazing. And then I finally went back to England. I was going to, I got to a point where I was like, I can either cycle to the Netherlands and push my luck with how fast I can cycle to the Netherlands to get on a boat to Scotland or I, or I can, um, or I can just take a train to the Netherlands, ferry over to Scotland, or I can just fly back to London. And so I got to the train station and I was finding out how much the ticket was. And the ticket was like expensive. It was much more expensive than I thought it was going to be. And um, so I was like, you know, I'm just going to hang out in Berlin for like a few more days. And then I'm just going to fly back to London. Sure. And just, just kind of rest. And I had already had accommodations in the London area set up. Um, and that's what I ended up doing. I ended up spending a few more days with my friends in Berlin, back to London. Um, and then spent time with a couple of, a couple of people in the London area um, I ended up spending about a month and a, almost two months with the guy that runs Mr. Lee's miniatures. I don't know if you're oh, familiar yeah, with sure. that. Yep. Absolutely. Um, Kyle Crookshank. Yep. Really, really lovely guy. Really His family. Nice really nice guy. Um, and just that was a great. Shout out to Mr. You. Lee's. Like a lot of times I'll see people. Oh ask, yeah. Like people will see busts and Absolutely. stuff and they'll be like, where can I get that awesome bust? And the answer Mr. is Lee. almost always Mr. Lee's minis like that. If yep. you're interested in that kind of thing, it's where you should be going. He has so much great yes. stuff. Yeah. And it was very interesting. Like he was a great guy to spend time with. They were outside of London, outside of London, like in a city called Basingstoke, which I lovingly nicknamed amazing Stoke. Uh, <laughs> to his, he hated it. It was, it was so funny. Um, and so it was really interesting talking to somebody who wasn't from England because I learned a lot about the cultural nuances of English culture. Um, okay. And so that was very interesting you know, also kind of seeing like the business side of things with how he was getting miniatures and selling them. And, you know, I, I kind of went around to a few little different shows um, with him that were local. And then uh, I'm trying to think went to Euro military. That was one of the bigger ones. Oh, nice. Um, and that was another one. It was a little bit smaller than Monte San Savino, but they also had all the vendor stuff and it was on. Um, oh, where is it? It's kind of a. It's a very famous port. Um, like Dover? Is it in Dover or something? It's very close. Let me see. I'll find it here in just one second. Not to slow things down uh, here. You're fine. It's all good. Folkestone. Okay. So Folkestone was where a lot of the, the troops were ferried from England to France in World War One. Ah, okay. Um, and it's actually where all of the people from Dunkirk got ferried over to. Hmm. If, you, if you know about the Dunkirk incident at all. Yes. Um. And so and I knew about it, it before that movie. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I, I still was kind of aware of the history of it a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was it was really interesting seeing like the like what used to be just massive naval infrastructure um, that was grossly deteriorating, of course, but you could still see it. Um, and so I actually ended up camping 
there as well. It was really cool. I, you know, I got to camp for a couple nights on the, the English coast and it was, I, I loved it. Like the winds were super intense. It was just kind of cold enough that, you know, you needed like a sweatshirt and, you know, your tent and, you know, your sleeping bag and everything. So, um, you know, I, I, I didn't do great at that show. I didn't do terribly because it's a much more strictly historical show. Gotcha. Um, but still, you know, kind of got to meet some people and make some more relationships and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and yeah, I was literally in Basingstoke with um, Kyle until Mont San Savino. Went over to Mont San Savino, which was just kind of like a flurry of flights, trains, and, you know, trying as hard as I could not to spend money because I needed to get home. Sure. Um, and yeah, flew into New York, you know, this was like mid November, um, right. and got home like right before my brother and sister-in-law got back or came in and had Thanksgiving. So it was, it was very, well, there very you good go. time that, that way. Was so. a hell of a trip, my friend. It was in at the end of the trip, though, kind of the whole time I had been deciding, like, do I want to do this professionally? Like, do I yeah, really sure. want to be be a professional miniature painter? Because well, and you had just spent so much time with, uh, with so many people that are doing it professionally and in a lot of different ways. In a lot of different ways. And, um, you know, it, it was important, too, because, you know, you're kind of determining a little bit of like your the path that your life is going to go to, right. which is always kind of a, it's nerve wracking. Right. Because you know, there's kind of the decision of like, oh, well, if I do this, you know, I might not make the most money, but I'm going to really love what I do every day. Um, and I talked to a lot of people and I finally talked to Alfonso Banshee and he was like, dude, you just got to make up your mind. You need to do it or not. <laughs> like if, like if you, if you, um, if you can't do it, like if you don't feel like doing it, then don't do it because you're not going to enjoy it. And like, do it with the understanding that like you're not going to die a rich man, but you're going to die having a very full life. Um, and so I was, you know, that was kind of like a very deciding factor. And like, I remember where I was, I was on a walk in amazing Stoke and it's really beautiful. It was like a three mile, like walking, you know, path. And I remember almost exactly where I was, you know, having that conversation with him and yeah, I mean, here I am two years later, you know, paying the bills. So that's right. <laughs> So it was the right um, choice. It was the right choice. Yeah. And so, yeah, when I got back from my Europe adventure, that was where I was like, I'm a professional miniature painter. This is day one. Um, and yeah, it's just been painting and working and working and painting, you know, ever since then, um, you know, going on to shows, kind of getting into the, the circuit of cons and teaching and um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, I, I love the life. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, it, I love the freedom that it kind of gives me, uh, but then there's also some times where it's like, oh man, I got to, this is crunch time. I got to get this commission done. Sure. Like, you know, so, and then of course you just meet so many amazing people. Um, you know, you, you build up a little bit of a fan base of, you know, a group of people that, you know, like your work and right. are interested in what you're doing. And, you know, you get to do the same with other people and, you know, you build up amazing friendships and, it, it, it becomes a lot more than work just because it's so it, it's like, it's like work, it's art, it's community and friendship. And like, it's, it, I love it so much because to some extent, like it's a family that you get to choose. Yep. Yep. And I've never really had that in another job. Like I, I kind of come close to having that with other work, but it's not the same because it's like you only really see each other at work. Right. Like sometimes you might have a friend outside of work, but you're not like, I, I don't know. Uh, well, we I, say it all the time. We'll be like, oh yeah, that's one of my work friends or something like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. All right. You can hear it in yeah. the language. Exactly. Yeah. The language and the, yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, and yeah, I've been very fortunate to have done well in some shows and that helps, you know, kind of get my name out. And I've been very fortunate to be able to teach at a lot of these shows. Yep you know, using and kind of disseminating what I learned when I was in Europe and kind of what I've learned from the fine art side of things and just from my own experience. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just, just the whole gamut of, I, I, I feel like I've had this really fortunate tra trajectory that not a lot of other artists have where, you know, I, I've only been painting for like five and a half, six years total. Right. As, and this is my, like I'm coming up to the second, 
the end of the second year uh, as a professional, full professional, and like to go from broke. Because when I got back from Europe, I was literally broke. I literally had right, like that was I, yep. Like it was like when I was in New York, I was like, okay, I can get a coffee in this two dollar bagel, and I'll have five dollars left in my account for when I get home. Like right. that's how shoestring I I like that's how close I came. Right. Um. To, so to go from being like completely broke to, you know, married with a with a kid, paying my bills, debt free, um you know, has been, to be fair, even for me, a little bit surprising. Um, but it's, it's like, you know, I've always treated it like a business and I've always worked really, really hard at it. Um, and so I think that's a big part of why it is where it is. Um, and, uh, you know, the other part of it too is just trying to put myself at the right place at the right time to meet the right people and, because that that's a part of it too, right? Yep. Um, and so, so, yeah, I mean, it's just all those kind of different things. Like, it's like that road to success looks all kind of crazy. You yeah, know? yeah. That's, it's very Jeremy Baramy looking. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's that one dot? That's that dot. What's that dot? <laughs> well, that's Tuesdays in July and sometimes never. <laughs> oh, man. That feels so great. <laughs> but, all right. Yeah, yeah. That's my that's my story. Very that's nice. Story. Well, let's it's a look crazy at one. <laughs> it is a crazy one. I mean, that has to be <laughs> one of the craziest stories so far on this show, and I love it. So let's take a look at some of that work that came out of that. Let's let's look at some of uh, yeah. your pieces here. All right. Uh, okay, so we're going to bring up here. Uh, I am starting with Magnus the Red. So right. uh, the original original recipe, Magnus, I should say. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> uh, obviously he's had a couple different versions over the years. and he, This is not the... This is the 30K version or whatever out of the the yeah. uh, featured character series as opposed to the big 40K monster. But uh, yeah, yeah, the I, one that, that Aaron likes a lot, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and I so. think I, I think you submitted this at Crystal Brush. I think you were in line like right in front of me this year because this oh, was yeah. from. This, this is from 2018. 18. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure you were in line, like, right in front of me. Like, I was sitting there watching you turn this in, yes. <laughs> oh, cool. Nice, man. Um, but, yeah, this one, I was fortunate enough to win bronze at Crystal Brush that year. So that was the first time that I had placed at Crystal Brush. Um, so it took me, like, three years, essentially, to go from, like, not even making the cut to placing in single-figure sci-fi. Right. Um, so I'm very, like, even though, you know, it's not a gold or it's not anything like that. But no, it's, it's, uh, it's any kind of award at Crystal Brush is, like, you know, a absolutely. Ooh. Yes. A hundred percent. That's not, yeah, there's only three and the competition is stiff to Stupid. say the least. Yes. Yes. Um, this year, who man, we can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, th this piece was, um, this was um, most of the pieces that I do are for private clients. Like most of the competition pieces that you see for me are commissions. I almost don't get to keep any of it um, just because, you know, keeping the lights on is always the priority. Right. Sure. So this is for a guy that's out in Australia. Um, yeah, and it was, it was kind of a, a interesting, it was an interesting process. Cause I had, I had been learning a lot of, I don't want to, I'm trying to think of the right way to put it. It was kind of new technique, but it was more, more like, I'm trying to think he kind of wanted a, a little bit of a traditional GW look to it, but just in NMM and in my style. Right. Yep. Um, and so what he kind of, that was kind of the parameters that he gave me. What I was learning a lot about at that time is something that myself and a lot of other illustrators and fine artists refer to as shape language, um, which is essentially that like specific shapes interact with light in very, very, uh, specific ways and though it doesn't change like it's essentially like it's scientific to some extent right or like you know this this can is always going to be because it's a cylinder it's always going to have the highlight going down this way right, right. It's essentially but then kind of thinking like in the big general shapes to the smaller specific shapes right and so this was kind of a uh, this was kind of like the culmination of a lot of that information um and even in the way that I treated the hair, I'd never, I, when I painted the hair even, um, and because it's so complex, I, I was like, I'm either going to lose myself in the complexity 
or I can forget about the complexity entirely and I can just work this big shapes down to the teeny, teeny, tiny shapes. Um, and so I did that with pretty much everything uh, really except for like the, the, the little kind of wispy white bits that are coming off of him. Um, Cause there's some things that you have to rule of cool. Um, right. Otherwise it just won't look right for a miniature. Um, but the way that I started, started it off was with airbrushing just because it can kind of help you find those general shapes to some extent. And then from there for the, all the gold, all the gold NMM was what I worked first. And it was really just a, Hey, I need to, it was more of a, a I need to bump up the, the value, like the, the highlights, the whites to really make it look reflective. And then I need to pick out everything. I need to pick out all the details. Uh, and then I need to clean everything up. And so uh, it was that kind of focusing on the big shapes down to the little shapes and um, just all the way through the miniature. Um, and I had some really fun little happy accidents happen. Okay. Like, um, most of the, most of the miniature kind of turned out the way that I had it in my head um, with the exception of like the, I'm trying to think of what they call it. It's, it's like the thing that's attached to his belt. Is it like a tabard? With the the bluish crystal, I know it's actually called something else, but let's call it the tabard because that's what I always yeah. call it too. And somebody corrected me once on the show and said, "No, it's actually called a this." And I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." And okay. then that immediately left my head. So there you uh, go. So yeah, I, I uh, those blue crystals. I was just like, okay, I'm gonna do some kind of like blue reflective thing. And I, uh, you know, I I got done with it. It was kind of like probably close to the end of the day, and I took a picture of it. And then I woke up the next morning and looked at the picture of it. And I was like, whoa, that looks like, like a crystal or it looks like a, you know, it looks really shiny. Like not just like, a, you know, not just like, cause you know how sometimes with miniatures, NMM doesn't look like a true metallic surface. Of course. Like that actually felt like realistic to some extent for me. I don't know if that, if that makes sense, but it does. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I mean, one of the things I'm fascinated with this is 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 your like let's call it sort of a, a mauve or peach magenta infused shadows in the gold. Um, you know, you use it on the torso, you use it on the left arm. It's some it's in some of the the uh, his like giant winged belt buckle, his like Aegis belt buckle or whatever you know. <laughs> um, and and it's just a really interesting shadow color. Like yeah, I can see it placed around in, in several places. And it's just mm -hmm. a fascinating addition because you could have gone for, uh, you know, a more standard uh, sort of brown infused shadow, right? Uh, in right. The gold. But instead, I really like it because you've actually hidden some more quote unquote red and you're actually playing with several different red yeah. tones on Magnus the Red here in an interesting way. Like his skin is very much like in the you, you've got that that peachy red spectrum mm -hmm. into his skin obviously his hair, you know, your purple that you used is a very red purple in the, in the interior of his cloak. So it's just fascinating. All these little color infusions. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And to touch on like the gold armor, um, one of my favorite, favorite colors is uh snake bite leather from the older GW sets, like the hex, the black hex pots. And so um, I, I was trying to figure out how to mix it. And this was, this was years before I painted this and I figured out that, you know, it's, oh, what is it? It's yellow, like a kind of like a warmish yellow with a purple or magenta. And then you have to add a little bit of red to it to shift it the right way. Um, and so what I was playing around with was like, Hey, what happens when I add more purple or magenta to this? Right. And I really bump up the saturation almost of the purple magenta tone. And that goes into the shadows. And then what happens if like, I put that in all of my shadows. Like if, if I have that kind of consistency in a, in a little bit more of a subtle area, does it cooperate well? Um, and so I try to use that as a little bit of a compositional tool with almost everything except for like the whites, um, right. his, and his hair. Um, and I, I didn't do it with the hair of course, because that's supposed to like really pull you up to right. him. Um, and of course, the whites. It I, it probably would have looked good if I had glazed a little bit of it in, but w with this, just like with a lot of things, there's always time restrictions, and you know there there were time restrictions to get it to the competition, and then there were also time restrictions in terms of 
how much um, how much I could paint this, you know, in terms of hours before right. I was starting to l- lose or go below what my rate would be for the client. Sure. So um, it's always kind of a battle between all of those things. But yeah, I, you know, yeah, I love, I really like looking, some of these pieces I haven't seen for a little while. And so like the, the way the cloak turned out, I was really pleased with, it feels just smooth enough and just like it's interacting with that harsh light enough that it's, you know, kind of popping without being distracting. But Absolutely. Yeah. It's got a nice silky feel to it. It does. Yeah. And yeah, oh. this, this guy was almost painted in like a fever dream. It seemed like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up, we have uh, now. Is this a full size warlord, or is this the warlord out of the Adeptus Titanicus? That is a full size warlord. Okay, I need to know the story behind this one because having participated in the painting of one of these things recently, <laughs> I decided yeah, that I never ever want to do this again because it is a freaking nightmare. They they are they are a work for sure. Oh, the... you ain't kidding. Building a house <laughs> from scratch is work. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces. So tell me about yeah. this guy. So um, this was this is actually the first Titan that I painted ever painted. Um, I was like, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it right. So um, I had a client who. Um, so the you know, first done mountain you ever climbed was Mount Everest. Got it. Okay, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah. If, if nothing that I've told you before this has has told you anything, I really, I I I like to go for the biggest thing I can you know, early on, I don't know what there is about my personality that is like that, but it's like, you know, if there's a big thing, I want to climb it. Like, you know, if there's an, if there's a goal or objective, I'm going to work really hard to do it. And it's kind of the same with this. I was like, I'm going to do this because everything else is going to be downhill. Right. From painting warlord, you know, and I had a maniple. So I, I was doing a, a warlord and then a, um, a reaver and then a warhound. Um, Jesus God. and so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hope you've got a big studio, my friend. Oh man, yeah. It it like the room was like it was funny because like for m- almost like a, a month or so, I had just warlords on that table back there, mm-hmm. um, which was great. So um, yeah, so I had a client had done work for him, and he was like, "Hey, I've got a friend. He wants a quote on Titans on a couple Titans," and I was like, "Okay, awesome." And um, the the client actually ended up being one of the lead organizers for Adepticon which was really cool. Oh, okay, cool. And so, um, yeah, I got it. You know, I, I didn't entirely, I kind of knew what to expect. Like what my expectation was maybe like three fourths the size that he actually was. They're so um, big. Here's the other question. So did you get it already like pre-cleaned with the resin or did you just get like the raw pieces? Out oh, I got the boxes. I got the boxes from London. Oh my God. Nottingham. Yeah. And so, um, it was like, to be fair, I, I really enjoyed it because it was a little bit like, um, it was, it was a process and yeah, not so sure. much, like, like there's definitely the creative element to it, but, um, I had had, I started working on this, I think when my son was three or four months old. And so my son at the time was just like maybe an inch or two taller than the, the warlord Titan, um, which was really, which was really funny. It was really adorable. Um, and so it was nice having something where like, it wasn't so much a creative exercise as much as like a, you know, it, it, I, I, I don't know how to, they're almost more of a traditional scale modeling type of challenge. They're tra- yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I got to bring out those tools out of the toolbox, um, which I hadn't been able to for a long time. Yep. And it, it the headspace that I was in as well was, um, that of, the manufacturer of a Titan and not so much like, because you know how most of the time when you get into painting something, or at least for me, when I do, I, I kind of try to get into a character's headspace. Sure. Like I kind of get into that. Like, why do they look this way? Why do they have these scratches or this yeah, hair? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You know? You're trying to place the, the figure in the world, understand its point of view, its life. What was it doing? What is it doing? Why is it like how it is now? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Whereas like with this, it was like more of like, I'm the fabricator general, like, yeah. building, you know, building and, you know, painting a, a Titan. And so it was a really, really great experience kind of getting to pull out those scale modeling techniques. Thankfully the cast was really good 
And so I didn't have to fight the cast too much to get it together. That's good. Um, which was a blessing because I just built one that had much more casting issues. Um, and it wasn't too bad, but it was just bad enough that I had to do like, you know, a few hours of sculpting work just to kind of, you know, even some stuff out. Um, but yeah, it was great too. Cause I got to kind of build more relationships too, with some people from, you know, the more scale modeling side of the Warhammer community, which was really fun. Um, and break out all the weathering techniques and kind oh, of yeah. getting balance of weathering. Right. And, you know, uh, it was a great opportunity for me too to kind of, you know, you know how before I was talking about the, that theory of shape language where like, you know, you have shapes, they interact consistently with light. And it was kind of like, okay, great. I get to test this theory on something way bigger now. Right, right, right. And it also has like some really interesting, but well-defined shapes, right? And combinations of shapes. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, I mean, you can really see, you know, you can see those shapes more clearly on anything that's like a cylinder. Um, and then like the little, the little um, like crotch guard, <laughs> you don't yes. know another word for it. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was, it was, it, it got tedious in some parts, but then there were other parts where it was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Like when you start to see it come together yeah. and then when it's done too, and you get to take a step back and be like, this could be a prop in a movie. Yeah. It look good. Like, you know, so it, it, it and then of course do, getting to do all the freehand work on the, you know, on like the, the, the ion knees shields and whatever. The, and yeah. That kind of stuff, yeah. yeah it was, so it was a it was a very unique experience and it's one that I, you know, now looking back on it, especially I'm very proud of. Um, and yeah, it was kind of the first time too, that I had gotten a job that big. Sure. You know, which was kind so of, it was almost like a test. Like, can I actually do something of yeah. this size in time? And you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was, it was a bunch of those kind of like, um, it was not only like kind of a fun, unique, creative thing, but then also kind of like a fun, like work side of things because it's like, oh man, like this is great. Like I, I'm getting paid to do this. This is like different. So anyway, I'm talking in circles now, but no, you're fine. It was a lot of fun. I had never worked on something that scale in the, the painting. The reaver afterwards was like, oh, this is fun. You know? <laughs> sure. sure. Then, then it, you know, then I got my hands on a, on a night and I was like, oh, this is cute. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know? Um, so yeah, that was. That was a good time. So somebody in the chat asked, what did you use for your rust on, on your, on your Titan here? What did I use for my rust? I used the, um, the AK interactive rust set. Most of the rust on this guy is the light rust enamel. Okay. Um, and what's, what's great about, um, working at this scale and kind of using those, uh, those scale modeling processes is that they're very dependent on like you do a big kind of segment of it and then you varnish it. Right. And then you do another segment of it and then you varnish it. And so what it does is it's almost like building and locking layers in Photoshop where like build something, you set it, you build something, you set it. And then you do extra work over that right. in order to like, I did the rust. I did, I did the, the kind of griminess, like the darker, almost like black brownish stuff all around the inside of the armor plates. And that was, I can't remember exactly. It was, it was an AK interactive enamel. Um, I just can't remember the name of it. It was a bunch of things mixed up because I was running out of things. Sure. So I was like, I'm, <laughs> yeah. pour, pour it into a thing. Okay, that looks dark and brown. Um, right. And then, of course, all the rust and, you know, almost to the point of obsession where, like, you know, if if it was a bolt, you know, if it, like, yep. it, it all got, you know, uh, I, I it almost turned in, it almost started turning into a little bit of a... Okay, I'm spending too much time on this kind of thing, but I still well, you get into the rhythm, right? With like, well. gotta attack yeah. the bolt, attack the bolt, attack the bolt, attack the bolt, and you just yeah, like yeah, yeah. it becomes this very zen process on these big machines. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and I mean, especially because like it was my like it was my time away from you know the house and in, in in my own space, and so I kind of like it's almost like what the dolphins do when they swim, where like you're half sleeping, you know? Right. <laughs> Right. Because, uh, of course, like Theo, uh, my son's name is Theo. He was like, you know, three or four months old. So it was very sleep deprived time. But yeah, a great <laughs> time. Too. Nice. All right. Next up, we have uh, 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 what's his name? Alpharius. Is that it? The, the our Alpha Legion guy. Is that who he is? Yeah, it is. Yeah, he's, he's I know. I know 40K stuff. There we go. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, yeah, everybody's all various, I guess. That's, I, I, somebody, I am all various. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this guy, uh, this was, this was the same client that I did Magnus and Russ for. Okay. Um, and so he was very, very fun. This was kind of a, this was kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to put it. It, it was almost like a monochromatic kind of thing that I was going for. Not, not so much monochromatic, but like harmonic. Yeah. Where I wanted all of the colors to be in one area. Yeah. Like an analogous color scheme where you're just, you're, you're literally hugging a very close side of the, of the sort of traditional color wheel. Right. Yeah. And so there were a bunch of other tech technical things that I had wanted to play around with as well. Um, this was kind of coming off of the, coming off of the steps of reading a book called um, glazing. I'm trying to remember the full title of it. It's like glazing, like traditional techniques or something like that. And really it, it's a book that really gets into the way that the old masters would paint. Um, and the way that the old masters would paint is of course, by using glazes of oil paint of like very, very intense transparent colors in order to get very, very, permanent, very vibrant colors, right? right. To the point of like 500 years later, they still look super intense, right? And so a lot of it kind of to get into some more of the, the intricacies of the technique comes into um, how, how your underpainting is done, which of course has a little bit of grayscale underneath that I worked on, like al almost a sketch, but just very lightly because I did a lot of the heavy lifting with the airbrush. Um, gotcha. And then what I did was essentially glaze from like the upper kind of yellow green colors mm -hmm. into the turquoises and then into the blues, which were phthalo blues. Um, but the other thing that I did there was I made my highlights more opaque and more, um, more eggshell-ish flattish kind of texture yep. whereas the shadows are very glossy and what that does is it it not only gives the illusion of depth even more depth than is actually there um but it also just like it really lets the colors kind of do different things like phthalo blue red shade if enough of it is accumulated and you turn it into light it actually starts to give off reds um and ultramarine does similar things where if it, enough, enough of it is stacked on top of itself, it'll start to give off purples. Um, and so you can do some really interesting nuance work with those kind of techniques. Um, and then to the other thing too that I had completely accidentally done when I was started painting this guy, or you know, I, I, it wasn't when I started painting him, I was like midway through what I was doing with the armor. And I was like, oh, what do I need to do? What, I, this is just missing something. And I accidentally watched, like I, it was completely spur of the moment. I watched Aquaman and was like, well, this was, this was a good thing <laughs> 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 because all of those guys have almost this exact kind of like scale armor. Right, right, right. And so I was like, oh, I can just, you know, I, and so I pulled uh, a little bit of reference and kind of, you know, I probably, I think I watched the movie a couple times and, you know, I, I kind of figured out like, okay, I, what I need to do is I literally need to go through all the scales and make sure that all of them have their own little shadow and all of them have their own little pinprick of highlights. Right. Because in, you know, there, there was a part of me that was like, is this going to work? I did it in a little test area. I think it was like the, the arm, like the bracer on his arm. And um, I was like, okay, it looks kind of cool right here. Is it going to work with everything? And so I did, I think I did like the shoulder pad or the rest of the arm. And I was like, okay, I think this is going to work. And I did it. I, you know, it, it took like probably a day, a day and a half to go through just all the armor oh, sure. and do yeah, yeah. all the little, you know, all on the scales and all the little dots. Cause each, each of the scales has a little dot of white. Um, and that was also kind of an experiment too, because it was like, okay, is the underlying value going to influence these dots of white? And it, and it did. Right. Uh, it ended up looking great. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a really interesting experience or experiment. And, um, the majority of the, like, I think almost the entire miniature is painted with, I want to say like six or seven colors total. Nice. Um, very limited palette, very limited palette. Um, and 
it's kind of great too because it has that diorama feel. Um, I was trying to do the white scar in a color that was like relative to the scene. So he still feels somewhat white or ivory or almost like he's in a cast light kind of environment right. with all the greens and everything. Um, some people liked it. Some people didn't. It was kind of a, one of those things that was like, oh, I don't know about this, but um, well, if there's ever anything that's going to make people go, well, I don't know about this. It's going to be yeah. painting a space Marine, even slightly a different color than what everybody thinks it's supposed to be. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so funny to me sometimes how, uh, and I mean, I love 40K. I love 40K to death. But it's almost started to turn into what the historical community does a little bit. Right. Where, where you have people that will go like, oh, the skull on that Space Marine's head, it needs to be silver, not gold. Right, exactly. Like, oh, you know, well, so, the French soldiers in that yeah, yeah, in yeah. the winter period of that engagement actually had gotten new gear in and so they were actually in this shade of blue and they had a different they actually had a different rope around their left shoulder and it's like oh geez old Pete's. yeah and so you know sometimes yeah I, I, I always do my best just to be like oh thank you you know and right you know then i'll be like oh okay like all right your rules lawyer like <laughs> you know, just, just enjoy it like you know yeah believe me like, i understand i put a lot of time into like an imperial fist captain and i and i he had a couple of elements i was like oh you know it'd be fun if i added a little green to this that'll be a nice little <laughs> contrasting color just on some on some and he's a captain he can customize his armor he's, he's in charge you know right and yeah. now people did not right. that was yeah. not that was not a popular choice so <laughs> that's okay that's all right yeah. uh all right so then we've got this fantastic barbarian, and I love this guy just because this is such a wonderful example of, I think, my favorite thing to paint and thing to be expressive which, with, which is, is skin tones. And yeah. you've captured so many wonderful tones in this. Like, this guy has such a wonderful muscularity to him. Thank you. And you've really captured it well. And, like... The yellow, the red, the blue, it's all working so well here in, in that. He just, he feels like he's out on a bright, sunny day. Like, it's great. Thank you, man. Yeah, and the, uh, this was this was one of those, I actually, this was the last piece that I painted when I was in England before Monte San Savino. And so, um, a lot of this is... Like when I see it now, I'm like, oh yeah, I was painting the, you know, the English, the, I was painting the path that I walked almost every day for almost two months. Nice. Right? And so I, I, you know, now looking back on it, I can very clearly see it and kind of capturing the, the, that sunlight, that warm sunlight that would come through when, you know, the clouds are clear and everything. Um, and also just kind of try, this is kind of like the culmination of almost that entire year of you know, this whole, not only the adventure in England, but also kind of like the, the adventure that led up to it um, right. and everything. So uh, trying a lot of different things, trying to incorporate, you know, on the, on the bear, all the markings on the bear and everything is all in oils and in pasto, try to kind of add something almost sculpturally through the paint onto the model. Um, and then, yeah, just, just really you know, going at it with the skin tones, just really trying to replicate a lot of what I had seen without, you know, copying directly. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, even for me, it was one of those things where I, I would kind of work on it like element by element. And by the time that I got to the end of it, you know, end of painting the model, I was like, is, does this, is this going to work? And then I built the base and I kind of, you know, was, when I was building the base was kind of where the storytelling started to kind of like creep into my mind of like, why, like, you know, going back to the, the whole character thing, character building is like, why is this guy so angry? Yeah. Like, you know, like there's not a lot of reason for somebody just to be this angry for no reason. Right. And so I, I kind of finally came to the point where I was like, um, the, it turned into a little um, vignette of grief. Like in, if you rotate it around, you can actually see there's like two candles and two different skulls. And one of the skulls is a little bit smaller than the bigger one. So you can kind of understand from that implication that like, it's probably his wife and a child to some right. extent. Like, and then from there, you know, if you're looking for it and you're trying to figure out the story, 
you can kind of figure out like, hey, maybe this guy has some of these magical elements from things that he killed and he's back where the story began, you know, having gone through this. And he's like, maybe, you know, it's like that story of like, does vengeance, like it doesn't fix things. Right. Like it kind of does, but it doesn't like you can't, you can't replace things that you've lost necessarily. So it, it was kind of a, an interesting, um, it was one of the first times for me personally that I had actually put that level of thought into it and whether or not somebody else understood that was irrelevant to me at that point. Right. It was this, it was my story that I was telling. And so, um, and then also just trying a ton of techniques that I had kind of been itching to try, um, and itching to experiment with. And he ended up doing, he ended up earning me a, uh, what was it? It was a silver and, you know, sci-fi fantasy standard. Nice. So I was, I was one of, I think six or seven that year um, in standard category that placed in that's that, awesome. that level. So, um, you know, it was, yeah, I, there's so much that goes into it. Like there's so much trial and error on the skin tone. And I think that's sometimes what like you almost have to do and what makes it work. And something that I figured out now, you know, just by doing more study and more research is that like, if you add on just tons and tons and tons and tons of um, transparent layers, eventually what happens is you start to get this almost like luminous kind of thing going on with right. your skin tones where it's actually starting to behave the way that skin actually behaves because exactly. of the way that light's interacting with the surface. Yep. And I think, I think a lot of people, some people experience that like the way that I did where they just work so hard at something that they just like beat the, they beat it to death. And then it, like it, I painted it the way that the character looks like it was barbaric to some extent, like it was refined, but barbaric in the sense that like, I just hit it enough times until it behaved. Right. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, <laughs> so yeah. And then, then all the other things, you know, the, the NMM and all of that, it was just, it, this was kind of almost catching on to the idea of shape language. Uh, you know, I, I had kind of figured out that like my highlights need to all orient a certain way. Right. Um, I had really learned from the big child guys, like how to stack my highlights and shadows in a way that compositionally looks very appealing. Um, like uh, the, the best example that I have is uh, if you look at like the shoulder like his, um, on my side, it's, it's the shoulder, it's the hand with the ax. Okay. If you look at the top of it, it falls from like the highlight to a really dark shadow. And then immediately it picks up really, really bright Yep. from there. And so that's just one of those things where like, if you have an overlapping kind of shape and rhythm like that, it's, it's in your best interest to go bright to dark yep. and then bright to dark. And what I hadn't really figured out at that point was how to connect all of it. And, you know, that's something that comes with more research and experience i've figured out at this point but it's you know this was like at, at the time this was my masterwork this was the best that i could have done right like so it's yeah i i have a lot of this is one that i have a lot of like emotional connection to just because it was for that and it was it was interesting too because like i literally traveled around with this thing in a shoebox <laughs> 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 for months for months and people were people were like people were almost angry <laughs> sure sure like elizabeth elizabeth beckley's reaction was like why are you doing this <laughs> why are you Aaron putting thought this it was in a shoebox yeah. yeah um and so it, it was great though because i you know i showed up the most you know I literally all i had was a backpack um with a couple days clothes and my miniatures that I was taking to the show, right? Right. And so I pulled out this shoebox, right? And I started unpacking it. And, you know, there's a few of the kind of people that are there. And I got there pretty early so I could get it all out and, you know, all that good stuff. And Ben was there and there were a couple of, you know, I think Matt Sechooks was there. And, you know, there were a couple of other, of other people. And I start taking this thing out and I take out my shoebox and then I, you know, I start un unwrapping all of the, um, the 
the paper towel and then the shrink wrap. Sure. And people are like, oh, he's taking out his entries. Ben thought it was hilarious because he was like, I I would not expect anything less from you. Sure. And so, um, you know, I, I got everything out and, uh, you know, it, it survived. It survived all the way from England to Rome to Monte San Savino back again and then to New York. And then um, I'm trying to think. I think by the time I got back to the U.S. and by the time I, I took it to um, Adepticon, I had actually built myself a wooden box. And so it wasn't quite as terrible. It seemed like I took it to some, maybe I took it to, I can't remember where, but I, I took it somewhere and I took it out and I had had it pack the same way. And there are just a bunch of people that were like, you're, why are you traveling with it that way? And I was like, it works. <laughs> it works. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't break. It doesn't chip. You know, yeah, as long as it's in there securely, but still has like room to move a little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's one of the things that's magical is like, if you want to keep your miniatures safe when you ship them, wrap them in like wrap them three, four five times with some shrink wrap. You're good. Yeah. Um, I, I always use like shrink wrap and then bubble wrap. And then I'll put yeah. like a little newspaper around the outside just to, for the, the cushion around the outside. Yeah, the of it. Oh, yeah. But yeah, this guy was this this was like my little treaties on everything I knew at that time. It was like looking back on it, it's it's almost a little bit busy, but like I just wanted to use I wanted to use everything I had learned from um sort of from the trip and from your experiences, from, yeah. Yeah, from like Adepticon to that point. Right. Because right. Adepticon that year is where really where it began. Because I did Adepticon, went home for a week, packed, moved out went to a masterclass from Kirill Kanaev and then literally two or three days after that masterclass flew to England. There you go. Um, and of course the whole adventure. So yeah, this, this was a, uh, yeah. I mean, do you have any other questions about it too, man? No, it's great. It's fantastic. I, I, here's my only light. Here's the last question I'll leave on. Did you intentionally make the environmental setting, the summer to fall transition as a mirror to the emotional state? No, it does that. So well done. It's like, that's what I think. Like, <laughs> it, it lines up there. You know what I mean? With that story. When you, when you said that story and then I, then I, it made me, it suddenly recontextualized the environment for me. Yeah. And it, it I, you know, I, I can even see that now even more so like I, I intentionally did the spiral because I wanted people to follow the spiral. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the way that I work, there's some, some of it's intentional. Usually I start working and I let the I let the work speak to me. Usually, it's like midway to like two thirds of the way through a project, and then even then, I usually I'm just like, you know, this piece has a lot of emotion in in it from the get go, but I don't get to do that as much now because of the way that I work. Um, and but yeah, this guy definitely had that and. I can see it now as well. Like, I, I just don't think of all of those things. I really let my subconscious kind of do sure. a lot of that work for me. Absolutely. Um, Cause if I tried too hard at it, it just, it just wouldn't work. Well, like, and you can end up overthinking it as well. Yeah. 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 You have to like, and, and this is why, you know, I was talking earlier about structural impressionism and why I like it so much is that like the, they were the guys and just as like a point of reference um, for everybody watching the structural impressionists are like uh Manet and uh Joaquin Sorolla and John Singer Sargent are all really famous structural impressionists because they still used the draftsmanship of like how to paint or how to draw and create structure underlying structure with anatomy and gesture and all the all those fundamentals for fine art and then they would do the impressionism in the work with the light on right. top of that right right and so that's kind of like that's what I try to do with my work. I like to know all of the structure and a lot of the science and theory behind what I'm doing. But when I work, I don't try to actively think about that when I'm gotcha. working. I, then I'm going into what I feel or what, I, you know, what I want my, the person who's looking at it to experience maybe a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, because the, the structure is going to be there. I'm going to use the structure no matter what, because I've, I've thought about it consciously and meditated on it so much and l observed it so much that it's going to come out. Right. Right. Uh, so anyway. Oh, nice. 
All right. So then next up, we've got uh, the bust. So this is uh, this is I don't remember his name, but he's the guy from from P three or from Privateer Press, I should say. Uh, yeah, everybody uh, always jokes around that he looks like a uh, what's that? He's an actor. Um, frack. What is it? Um, da, da, da. He was like a really famous actor. Seemed like from like the mid eighties. But anyway, um, yeah, this guy was like the let's have let's have fun with NMM. Like, right. let's see how far we can like push texture with NMM. And yeah. I, I'm the it, the gold the the gold armor was really where I started and it took like three different iterations for it to get to this point. Um this was very early on. Yeah, Magna PI, yeah, that, nice. that guy. Oh, he does look like Tom Selleck. Okay. Yeah, Tom, there, yeah, there we go. There it is. Yeah, that mustache. Yes. The Excellent. box art. The box art too um, looks like an actor as well. Sam, the the older version. Oh, of the older version looks like Sam, like Sam Elliott. Elliott. Or Sam Elliott, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. There you go. Yes. So yeah, the gold armor went through like three different iterations, um, trying to figure out exactly how to work it, right? And that was really where I started. Um, and then I started it. Then I started working on kind of the steel MM. The steel in them, I, I, you know, looking back on it now, some of it works really well, some of it doesn't, but I was really trying to play with the idea of bounce light to some yeah, extent. Sure. Reflective or like colors, ambient yeah. light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I even tried to play around a little bit with that on the gold, kind of by introducing those green notes, yep. you know, to make it integrate with the blue a little bit better. Um, and that was really the focus of it. Like, the blue armor itself, like, in some ways looks really good, but... Um, this was very kind of sketchy as well. I, I'm trying to, th I think I painted this guy over the course of like three days or something. Sure. Um, I didn't have any commissions at the time. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm just going to, there's this competition for this miniature. I'm just going to kind of sit down and, or I, I was probably waiting on something in the mail. And so I was like, I'm just going to play with this and paint it. And he ended up turning out fairly well. I'm not super happy with the, like the white highlights on the blue armor, but like the backside the whole generator, the power generator back there, um, I feel like turned out really well. I, I did something with a like a disc, the way that it, it reflected. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yep. Um, but there, there were there were a few technical errors. This is one of those ones that just felt very like um, it felt like an illustration almost more than a. Yeah, hundred percent. It looks like to some extent, hundred percent. Like if when you when you look at a lot of illustrations for games and art and stuff. They're not making like all they, they have access often to like computer software, and even then, they're not ultra yeah. smooth blending it, right? They are yeah. being like more impressionistic in things, casting some hard light, having some hard lines because it's actually visually interesting. Those hard lines add yeah. a lot of visual confusion on the 2D page, right? Right, yeah, they, they, they add a lot of distinction, and then, yeah, you're right. The way that a lot of the, the illustrators render materials is not super, super smooth. And this is kind of like where I'm at too, where like, you know, I know that gold armor, even beaten gold armor wouldn't look like that. But I know that if I paint it in this way with this style, it'll look really satisfying. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of where I, I landed on with this one um, was just like, okay, let's just play around with a bunch of different materials. Let's play around with a bunch of different material materials. Let's still try to make the character the focus um, but yeah, let's just, let's just try out a bunch of ideas and see how they work together and let's try to force them to work or make them work or as many of these new ideas as I can, you know, of like, you know, the, the bounce light and the, you know, just the different color interactions and, you know, some of it succeeded and some of it failed. I think this is a, a good example for me too, of like, you know, this is like almost a 50, 50 for me of like success and failure. Right. Also that like because I failed so much in some areas with this, it, it put me in conversations with people where I learned how to fix them. And I learned how to understand more about why they weren't correct necessarily. And I think that's an important thing. Like, it's like, you know how sometimes, you know, the, have you ever heard that saying where like the best way to get the, the best way to get the right information on the internet is to, 
post the wrong thing. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Because sure. then everybody's gonna tell you yep. why it's wrong. That's right? fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And so this was a little bit of that, um, and not not intentionally necessarily, but it was more of like a I feel like this isn't right, and I don't know why. And so I'm just gonna kind of get it to a point of, you know, finish maybe like 80, 90 percent, and then be done. Yeah. Because I'm not like if I spend more time past that. I'm not going to be learning anything new. And so I, why should I spend more time past that? Right. right. And so then when I took it to a couple of competitions, you know, I started getting like, oh, you know, if you did this with your OSL, you know, you should, you need to research additive light, you know, you need to, you know, maybe take a look at the way that, you know, these things actually reflect light. Um, you know, all these, all these incredible bits of feedback that like really help push me to that next train of thought yeah. that I might not have had naturally or i might have had to fight more for um you know without having done this piece so it's awesome all right and then the next piece is the i don't remember this guy's name but it's the big orc rager dude uh yeah with the with the two weapons and what's fascinating about this is you sent uh some of the whip shots as well along so if you want to talk about this or like uh whatever i'm going to circle cycle through the whip i put them in what i think is the proper order uh so like we start with the sort of base some very you know base coloration and then he gets the yellow added as well as you know you're, you're setting some of the other values and just you know kind of colors in for what you think other things are going to be and yeah. then we can see the back and then you know adding a lot of the white for like the highlights and stuff like that so yeah yeah um sorry i'm trying to get all the because all the images are kind of out of order here on my side yeah, so, yeah. I, I tried my best to guess what i thought the order was <laughs> no no no, you're fine man um let me see here let me go back to so yeah th this was um like remember how i was talking about the barbarian yeah um and how the skin tone developed this is actually kind of very similar this is an evolved version of that to some extent because um this is like the barbarian skin with an additional almost two years of knowledge on top of it, right? So the way that I started it was, um, of course, zenithal priming. Yep. And then I, what I did is I kind of washed or glazed um, a red oxide. And so with this guy, I, I set the goal of, I'm only gonna use pure pigments. I'm only gonna use, you know, pure pigments out of the bottle. I'm gonna mix everything myself. Um, and what I found out is that I actually don't have to mix a ton. I just let transparency do a lot of the heavy lifting for me. Sure. Were you using like traditional HBAs, artist acrylics, Chimera? What were you using to get for tequila? Yeah, I was using uh Chimera and golden acrylics. Okay. Golden fluid golden fluid acrylics right. were my main and then Shrinka titanium white. Those were the colors. Um and so yeah, I of course did a couple of washes, glazes with the red oxide. And then from there I just started to kind of sketch up my highlights and everything using um, essentially just using a combination of different things. I didn't really know where I was going. I had a reference. I had some reference from, that I pulled from, uh, you know, Blizzard, uh, World of Warcraft, all that good stuff. And I really just tried to use that as a point of reference and kind of try to find my way to a point of like transparency and, you know, underpainting to where it felt right. The other thing too, though, that I had really strongly developed at this point, which is a little bit more of an advanced concept to some extent, um, is having like different zones of um, highlighting and shading. Maybe I can, I, I don't know if I can send you a picture really quick of it because it, it would help make sense. And I'll, I'll kind of keep talking about it as I go. Um, the idea though is that you have like let's say you have like a highlight zone right like uh we can say it's here on my my forehead um within this zone of highlights there's going to be there's going to be a highlight a mid-tone and a shadow just for the highlight zone right right for the mid-tone zone there's also going to be a highlight a mid-tone and a shadow but my highlight for my mid-tone might only be like a mid-tone or even a shadow for the highlight right Right. And so actually like quantifying that thinking and actually saying, okay, this, this actually functions well. I'm going to focus big shapes down to medium shapes. And I'm going to kind of do that process of like, I'm going to work up my highlights. I'm going to glaze over it, which is kind of where it goes to, 
you know, back to the orange, the really orange tone that you're seeing. And I had to play around with that a couple of times to get the, the hue correct. Um, and then from there, what I started to do is really implement all of the, um, here, the, here it is. Um, that's where I really started to implement those, those value zones kind of, um, kind of thinking. So yeah. here, let me send you this image so that you okay. can sure. put it up if you yeah. care to. Sure. That should be it. Yeah, that's it. So you, can, you can kind of see it a little bit more more closely there. And I, I have it all written out and all kind of, and this is the way that I also that I do master studies. Um, you know, not necessarily by, you know, you can see with this, this was for a student. I was really outlining the shapes just to get the student to think about like each of the shapes. Yeah, um, give me just a moment. I'll bring it up here on screen while you're talking about it. Give me just one second. No problem. I know I'm kind of. Because it's a good, deep, no, it's a good uh, reference. All right, should be here in just uno momento. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was really utilizing that. And then um, I also, there we you go. know, I've got that I'm, image up now. Okay, awesome. So yeah, I mean, you can really, you can really see the way that I outlined all the shapes, really basic shapes, even though they have a lot of complexity. Um, sorry, folks, that my face is kind of covering that a little but most of it's still visible. So <laughs> sorry about that. And so, yeah, it really is to, because the human anatomy looks very, very complex, but if you can simplify it, it helps so much because, and this is something that miniature painters do a lot, in my opinion, is they go like, oh, details, 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 details. Um, and the problem is, is that they're so focused on the details that they lose sight of the big picture. Right. So that's something that I'm a very big proponent of is like, ignore all of the details and focus on the big structural things first. And of course, teaching what those big structural things are. And then from there, then we go into the medium size things. Right. And then only at the very end, are you allowed to focus on the details? Yeah. I because think of it a lot. Like I, I try to explain it as like an inverted pyramid, right? I'm starting no matter what it is. I'm starting with just the biggest shapes, volumes at the largest scale. Right. And then I just slowly bring it to the point right. in any particular section. Exactly. And yeah, I mean, you can kind of see over there on the top left side of it, like um, the, the, the mid tone for the highlights right. on the highlight area, you can see it, you know, kind of placed into the mid tone section. It looks like a highlight. Right. And then the same, you know, with like a mid tone shadow in the mids is a highlight in the shadows. Right. Um, and so there's just all these kind of, that, that was what I was thinking of. And then the other thing that I was thinking of, to make this even more complex, um, <laughs> I hope this is all inter very interesting for you guys, um, is I I really wanted to play around with the idea of ambient uh, ambient occlusion and ambient light, right? And the, the, re the thinking behind that is like, you have a big light source, like the sun, right? And that casts light, um, but, and you, can, you guys can kind of see it in space, right? Like when the sun casts light and there's no atmosphere, you have black shadows because there's no light. There's right. no light. Um, but what happens when the sun light hits the atmosphere is the atmosphere diffuses it. And so if there's a cast shadow, the light that's coming in, that's been diffused, which shifts into a bluer hue comes into the shadows. And so what I did though, is I took the saturation slider and I ramped it up a little bit. Yeah. So let's go back to the photo and there we yeah, can see. Sure. So if we look at the final product, we can see how much you've pushed sort of the 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 almost the, the blue shadows which is also works great and is super fun against the the orange skin right we've got a natural sort of uh complementary color scheme there where it's it's really making the orange seem more intense by upping the saturation on the blue right yeah and you know one of the things that i did and I, here i actually have the picture kind of as we're talking i worked as a customer like service agent uh, at t-mobile for a long time and so i can like talk and do things on the computer <laughs> with a lot of ease. um one thing that i did as well is i actually learned how to use a new tool which is um blender it's a 3d programming or a 3d animation tool um and it actually can simulate light environments very very well and so i actually did a light simulation to be like hey is this something that i can do that's going to look well is somewhat realistic that maybe I can artistically push the limits of a little bit. And 
I did the the you know the simulation and found out that like hey this actually kind of functions well, and so I decided to push it on the model itself. Before so right. so before any glue actually touched the model, um, it was really just you know that analogous har harmonic kind of yellows through oranges and reds reddish browns kind of things before the blue started to get mixed in and added and then intensified even. Um, and so it, this was a, this was kind of a, this is a black, I, I love this piece. This is one of my favorite pieces that I've ever done. Um, it, it, this was another one too, where, you know, the client, you know, hired me to paint it at a very high level and the amount of time um, gave me the opportunity to kind of tell that story. And I mean, if you guys are familiar with World of Warcraft at all, you know that one of the big things with an orc is the fact that they've been enslaved. And so it's kind of like, why is this orc angry? He's fighting for his freedom. It's not, it, it, be, it doesn't become that barbaric, aggressive orc anymore. It, it humanizes it. It makes it relatable. And, you know, it turns it into like a symbol of something and not just of anger and fear. Right, right. right. Yeah. So, and, and besides all the things that are going on in China right now, I know it's kind of weird to talk about that with, you know, all of that going on. But, um, but yeah, I mean, on top of that too, you can kind of see going from the barbarian to this orc and kind of talking about how to connect all of the tissue, you know, right. you can tell that those lessons have been learned, um, kind of the, the ability to kind of differentiate those zones of highlights and shadows in the different zones of highlight and shadow, um, gave me the opportunity to really perfect like the muscle, like the sinew in the transparency of the muscle on the chest and all, you know, all kind of like I really advanced you know, this was kind of the most advanced non-metallic metal that I had painted um, at the time because I had really refined ideas about what light does when it interacts with different, like, levels of chromatic metal. Um, so there are a bunch of, a bunch of new theories that had gone into this. Um, and this for me, and I think you can probably relate to this, you know, working professionally, is that sometimes when you work professionally, it doesn't feel like you're growing. Sure. Um, and for me, like the first like year and a half or so of was like, am I growing? Am I just grinding out piece after piece? And so I did this piece and was like, oh yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting better still. Okay. This is okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. It can be one of those concerns. I'm going to, I'm going to flip back to you here, put your back up on the screen. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. It can be one of those things where you're like, you can kind of get into a rhythm and wonder if you're still actually pushing yourself because you don't have the time. To, you know what it is? It's because you don't have the time necessarily to fail, right? Right. You don't have the time to fail. You don't really even have the time to like look at what you're doing like in retrospect. Yeah. Necessarily, like it, it almost has to be something like this where it's been three months to a year or something like that, and you're having a conversation with somebody and seeing your own work again with fresh eyes. Right. Right. So, all right. Yeah, man. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's start coming toward the end here. We'll do some questions. People in the audience watching, if you have some questions for Anthony, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Uh, but I'm going to start with my questions. So here we go. Are you ready for the lightning round questions? Oh yeah. All right. Question the first, and you have to answer, uh, you have to, you have to give an answer of just one. You ready? Only yeah. one. <laughs> Who is your favorite miniature painter, past or present? Oh, man. Yeah, it's a hard question because hard you question. just named like 50 amazing people on your trip you met. You know, we all have like so many idols. There's so many amazing people. But if you had to pick just one, who would it be? Um, I'm I'm going to say Kirill. Um, I think. Carol, or you just want the one word, right? You want to, or do you want to? Here you go. What's that? You kind of cut out there. Sorry. Did I lose you? Oh, hold on. Okay, there you are. There I, you I, go. I, I, now you're back. Okay, so yeah, I said, I said, Kirill, Kirill Kanaev. Gotcha. Yep. Very, very uh, excellent choice. No, yeah. no complaints there whatsoever. Uh, and a popular selection amongst uh, a, 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 a very popular selection in answer to that question. Yeah, he's just the like the master, yeah. I think. In the absolutely, 
All right. Do you have a uh, do you have a favorite color? A favorite color of paint? If you had to go to a single color? Hmm. I don't. I don't. I you know I I like warms. All right. There you go. That's a good answer. So the war the warm part of the spectrum is interesting to you. Do you find yourself turning cold colors into their warm version sometimes just to have fun like using warmer greens or pushing warmer blues using warmer purples? Um, it's more the yin yang of it. I, I don't know if that's that's a good way to put it, gotcha. but like the interaction between because they're always in synergy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, do you uh do you lick your brush? Do you eat paint? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what paint tastes the best? Or alternatively, you can say what paint tastes the worst. That's usually wow. the easier one to answer. Yeah, the one that I'm trying to think, the one that tastes the worst, I, I tasted some of the contrast paints recently, and they are wretched. They are yeah. terrible. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, it's that, like, whatever is in it, it's got to be, like, that flow additive. It t- yeah. Oh, God, it's horrible. By the way, it's here's ter- my official disclaimer. Don't eat paint, kids. This is just being joking, okay? We're not recommending you to eat paint. Don't eat paint. Everybody I, knows that. There you go. Okay, continue. I did the math on it, though. So in order to go into acute toxic shock <laughs> from consuming, from consuming, um, even like very harmless, sure. um, you know, the paint, non-toxic and, acrylics we tend to, yeah, the non-toxic yeah. acrylics, you would have to consume something like, I think it was like 20,000 pounds or 20,000 gallons of it within a couple of hours. Okay. So like really, really the only ones that you need to be really careful of are the ones that have like and more lead yeah sure sure like the heavy metal things like that or stuff like that that's in there yeah yep all right uh my my last question then we'll go to an audience question uh which is what is your favorite type of miniatures to paint and by the way type here means whatever you want it to mean okay i i really love 75 millimeter um it's just enough that you can be extremely creative and it's not so small that it's limiting in terms of because like when you get down into like 28 true you have to be extremely technically accurate in order to paint it well right and so it limits your creativity it becomes an exercise in technique and not so much in art and i feel like the bus gives the best air arena to like tell stories, be extremely creative, kind of start to bend or, you know, push the boundaries of what you can do. Right. And also learning because like w- when you're learning big, it's easier to take what you learn big and transfer it small. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 75 is for people who've never painted like 75 mil or bus size stuff. I couldn't recommend it enough. It is, a, it is such a more, I, I I don't want to say like le- non-stressful or I-, I don't know. Like it does feel like a more freeing experience is the best way I can say it. It's just, it's strange. It's a different, yeah. it's a, it, it has a completely different, almost what I would say is tone to the experience. That's literally the best way I could say it. You know, it, it, the whole experience feels different. Yeah. 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 I did it. I got like, or like, to me, no sure be done. Oh man, I still have a lot of canvas that I need to fill, like yeah. in terms of like color nuance and shadows and you know light and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, this is this is gonna be fun. This is more than I was expecting. But it was also like what you were saying, like a change in pace and tone. So, yeah. yep. All right, a couple quick questions from the audience. Uh, ben Cantor, our buddy Ben. What's up, Ben? He says, uh, big hey, question up, for a Rod. Any big golden demon plans, and are you gunning for that sword? Um, no, really big, no really big golden demon plans yet. Um, I I'm not one of those people that can really focus on projects months and months and months out. Like, I really give myself like two or three months before. Okay. And this, you know, this golden demon is going to be so. Yeah, intense and aggressive insane that, like, insane is the word you're looking for it is going to be a madhouse trying to go into it with expectations of placing even are just you know i'm going to enter stuff and be like i entered right <laughs> and I, I, that's where the expectations stop <laughs> yes exactly my 
Yeah, the bar for success is did I hand my things over? That, yeah. And I mean, you know, not only that, but there's going to be a lot of the European guys coming over, yep. and that raises the bar even more. Um, and so it's just going to be so high. And I know that there's going to be other companies doing um, competitions. I, I, and we, we can talk about the whole Crystal Brush games, you know, games day scenario too here in a minute. If you, I think it's a very interesting thing to talk. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm not gunning for that sword. There's, yeah, yeah there's just, I, I would, if I started now, I think I could make a run at it. But sure. I got, I got to keep the lights on. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Uh, Dave's question. If you were doing uh, that mid-tone, low-tone painting technique on large areas of a tiny GW ultramarine, uh, which, like, what kind of paints would you use for all the different tones of blue? So I, I want to amend Dave's question just a little bit. Rather than trying to get at paint names, let's start with this. Would you try to break down on, say, like a standard, you know, heroic scale Space Marine, that same stretch... And would you go to different paints or would you go to more of like an artist palette where you're just mixing it? You know, you're starting from a sort of central blue or something and you're just kind of mixing out from there by adding in, you know, red tones or purples or something like that or for your shadows and, you know, mixing in uh, maybe some yellows lightly or maybe even a little white for your for your high tones. So this is somewhere for me that I think is I, I wouldn't try to get that specific into the zones because there's not as much space. Intricate work, intricate things going on, like muscle demands. Like it just doesn't really function the same way, especially because the objects are much more, um, they're much simpler. Right. right. And so what I, what I would do, though, is I would have a very simple palette, like, and I can give actual colors. I would literally probably just use white, phthalo blue, green shade, phthalo blue, red shade. Um, phthalo blue, green shade is relatively warm, and phthalo blue, red shade is relatively cool in terms of blue. It sounds very oxymoronic. They're all, they're, they're both cool colors in terms of their position on the color wheel, one is closer to yellow and so it's warm and one takes longer to get around the color wheel. Um, and so it's cool, you know? And so you can really use that in terms of like, you have your highlights and then you go into your warms because the warms are gonna be on the upper part and then you shift into the cool blue, the, the bottom, like the lower mid tones and the bottom parts, right? And you end up, uh, you end up with a really, really beautiful space marine. Um, I'm actually trying to find a picture because I actually painted a space marine this way not too long ago, and I can send it to you. Nice. Uh, while we're uh, while you're doing that, I'll since you since you can multitask. Uh, rerolling ones. Jack's question is: How much of your painting skill do you think is natural talent, and how much of it is learned? Um, that's a really great question. It's, it's a, uh, it's a challenging one too. I, I think that I have, um, in terms of natural talent, I do think that that natural talent talent is a thing. Um, I think that I have natural talent in terms of an eye for light, um, how I see and understand light. Um, but beyond that, I would say, I would say it's like five, maybe 10% talent. 90% work. Um, an artist should always be an artisan first, right? If it's because if it's not a craft, if it's not like, um, if it's not a discipline before, then it, you're going to be waiting around for the motivation in the, the muse in the, the creativity to flow. Right. And if you're doing that, then you're never going to produce work. And you have to produce and produce and produce. Like it's like what I told you. Like the first, you know, three and a half, four years was really just me grinding out. Like the first two years was like, oh man, this is a fun hobby. Like I really enjoy doing this. I'm going to spend a few hours doing this every day, right? Right. And then it turned into I want to get good at this. Then I started grinding out four, five, ten, you know, eight, ten, sometimes ten hour days of right. study. You know, and when I would go to these museums, I had a sketchbook and I had, I was taking notes. I was doing sketches, you know, I was doing studies when I was in Europe at these museums. And so it was, it's a, all of that work is what facilitated my ability to be able to 
produce the level of work that I can produce. Yep. Um, that, and that's the most, like, I think that that, that needs to be told and emphasized so much more because it's not this like ephemeral thing. Like I just woke up one day and was like, I'm good at this. Um, and I, I, I love to, that I have the opportunity to teach because I've taught a few classes now on that concept of ambient light. And when I usually at the end of the class, I take my students outside so they can actually start to observe it outside right. of a controlled environment. And it's like, it's like looking at a great old one. Like it's almost too much sensory information because it all seems apparent. And then you bring it to the conscious mind and then you're like, Oh wow. There's this whole thing. I didn't think about ever before. Right. Because your brain just smooths it all out. Yeah. Because like one of the examples that I give is that like I teach, um, I teach shape language. Right. And I say, okay, cylinders, you know, like here's a cylinder, the highlight matches the shape. Here's a sphere. The highlight matches the shape. Here's a plane. Planes interact this way with light. And I go, okay, does that make sense? And, you know, everybody always goes, oh, yeah. You know, I have people, some people go, oh, yeah, of course. Like, and then I say, how many times have you ever thought about light in this way before you heard me give you this information? And that's when they all go, oh, never. Sure, sure, sure. So there's so much of it that's learned that then has to be implemented. And if you don't have that, and then also seeing that and ta- letting them take it from the perfect platonic forms of those shapes into how they're existing on our miniatures, right? Where you'll yeah. often have an interesting combination where part of this shape is going to be like a cone or a cylinder, but then there's also this other part over here that's a plane, right? Where it transitioned and, and then there's a sphere on the side where it, you know, and so on and so forth, right? And all these things sort of get right. shoved together to make yep. people <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. or armor or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And, and like you have like, and that's what I found. And that's what I really try to emphasize with my, with my instruction is that I didn't have a lot of that when I started. And I wish that I did. I had to learn most of it by going to something else outside of miniature painting. Um, and you know, I had to work really, really hard to get to that point. And so I try to ease that level of work for, you know, my students and, you know, the people that I talk to about miniature painting and art and, but then you have to do the work to get good at it. That's the, no matter what it's like, it's like, um, my dad does construction and, you know, contracting. He couldn't build a house from the ground up if he hadn't worked really, really hard over five years to learn how to do that. He didn't wake up one morning and know how to frame a house. It wasn't, right? it wasn't an instinctual thing. Yeah. 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 But, but nobody ever asks the carpenter like, Oh, you have such a talent or tells the carpenter. Right. You know, it's just, it, it's implied that there's work. And so I think with art, there needs to start to be the same kind of like train of thought or understanding. So Agreed. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I went really, <laughs> really no, far. I'm glad one. you did. Cause I, it's a huge I know we're going thing. on a long time. No, yeah. it's fine. I don't know a single artist where at least 80, 85, 90% of their talent didn't, or of their, sorry, of their capability. There you go. That's what I want to say. Didn't yeah. come from, from work and not just from, you know, people have, can often have an, I agree with you, like an innate eye for light or mm-hmm. maybe composition or color. Like some people are just really good at kind of having an innate sense of like how color works together well and stuff like that. Yeah. I've noticed that a lot where just, you know, uh, you know, my wife, for example, tends to have a good eye for color, right? She doesn't have any formal training. She's, that's, that's a thing. But like the, the, the road from translating that to the capability of doing high quality work is a huge <laughs> amount of learning in between, you know, yeah. Michael Jordan had an immense amount of natural talent that then got him failed off of his college basketball team because he never worked hard to actually learn it. And then he had to go and actually put in the hours and put in the practice. Yep. And he had this huge resource of natural talent, but only through hours and hours and hours of work. The Beatles were amazing musicians, no doubt, but they also spent 60 hours a week for almost yep. five years playing in you know German dive bars, basically. Yeah. Playing together, putting in those hours to get skill to you know to really magnify what was undoubtedly uh, a wealth of natural talent into being great right right and that's and the i think the thing is though is that once people get to that point like once people get to that point of um of success or 
like being recognized for their ability. Like a lot of times that's a person's f- initial introduction to that person. Right. And because it's that person's initial introduction, they assume that it, that person has always inherently had that. Right. Because it's their first taste of it. I, I don't know. It totally like makes it, sense. And then the only thing they really see of them is the finished work that is super high yeah. quality. Right. Yeah. It's like initial confirmation bias. Exactly. I don't know another way to put it. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think that, especially with art, like, especially with visual art, it's something that I think that lately has started to be demystified a little bit more, but it's still, you know, tricky. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Well, Anthony, I think we've, uh, we've come to the end here, sir. This has been great. This yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it, it definitely has. I, I, it's, it's a pleasure getting to chat with you more. I'm looking forward to, to seeing you at the cons more now. Hey, um, I, absolutely, man. We are going to be hanging out with you. I, I'm going to see you at Adeptcon. Uh, oh, yeah. One of these years, Nova and Reapercon are going to happen on a separate date. I'm sure of it. Yeah. And then uh, I'll see you at both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And uh, congratulations again on, you know, the best in the show and all the success at Gen Con. Thank you. Um, it was a, it was a pleasure, you know, and an honor being able to judge your work. So. Yeah. And, and let me tell you what, let me, let me to return the favor and say this. If you're looking, if, you know, depending on whatever you do, whatever you do for Golden Demon, but also I'm judging for Resin Beast next year. So, you know, maybe get yourself a creature caster thing. I'd love to see a big yeah. monster in that case from you. That'd oh, yeah. be an honor to judge. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I would love to. I would really love to. I, hopefully, hopefully I can uh, convince one of my clients to be like, hey, you should do a creature caster. There you go. All right. That's somebody, somebody watching this hit up Anthony with a creature caster commission. <laughs> Let's make it happen, all right? We can get it out there. Somebody wants an awesome demon or monster, and there is no better man you could select to do it. Uh, (laughs) Remember, look down in the description. Find Anthony's socials, his Patreon. Obviously, I I think if you've seen the amazing work, you've heard the amazing journey, obviously, this is a great guy to learn from. Go check him out. Uh, So do please, please, please go follow him on everything. Participate in that Patreon if you're interested. But Anthony, it's been an absolute pleasure, buddy. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. To you out there watching, thank you very much, everyone. As always, it is deeply appreciated. And we'll see you next time.